tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. I have found many times in my life that strange occurrences are a staple in human culture. Ghostly apparitions, UFOs, Bigfoot, and others are all prominent in our lives one way or another. You may not think of them all that often, but eventually there is a story in the news or a tidbit of information from a friend or a passerby that makes you recall such oddities. At some point or another, no matter how many times you forget about the subject, you will think of it again. I had forgotten all about the monster living in my mom's pantry for several years. I had forgotten all about it, that is, until now. I was only ten years old when I first had been told about the monster. It was a normal evening at my house. My mom and I waited for my father's arrival, and I helped her cook dinner. I looked back on these memories fondly as I enjoyed my mother's company and was delighted whenever my father came home each night. I had a picture-perfect childhood, save one peculiarity. Whatever resided in the pantry would reveal itself, if only audibly, that very night. I was cutting vegetables up for my mom's famous beef and barley soup when I heard a scratching at the pantry door. I jumped and nearly cut off one of my fingers in the process. My mom looked over at the pantry, then looked at me with a concerned smile. I looked to her for an answer, seeing as I had no private theories on the matter. We had just come from the pantry and shut the door. There was nothing in there at the time, and nothing could have made its way in after. Rats, maybe? No, no. The noise was far too loud to be such a small animal. My thoughts were put to rest when my mom spoke. There it goes again, scratching at the pantry door. What is it, Mom? Uh, I asked, still confused. I can't be certain, sweetie, but it's been there ever since we moved in. Sometimes it scratches at the door, other times it knocks food off the shelves. Some nights it doesn't make a sound at all. I was bewildered and scared at the same time. My mother noticed this. It's nothing to be scared of, honey. Is it a m monster? Though my mother's words were comforting, I could not be certain that they were true. No, of course not. Just then, the scratching started up again. I jumped for a second time. My mother then walked over to the pantry door. I was scared for her life. Here, look. She opened the door as the scratching continued. Just as the door became ajar, the noise ceased. See, sweetie? It's just as scared of you as you are of it. There's nothing to be afraid of. No matter what my mom said, my ten-year-old heart couldn't help but race. I was afraid and couldn't help it. For years, I continued to help my mother cook, but I never once set foot back in that pantry. I just couldn't bring myself to do it. I was convinced that the thing living in there was a monster. The fear was kept alive by the occasional sounds of whatever was in there. I would try to ignore it, but sometimes I would have to leave the kitchen. Eventually, the noises stopped altogether. It's been many years since then, and both my parents have passed away. My mother died of a heart attack, and my father died just weeks later of lung cancer. He always did have a bad habit of smoking, even in the house. It was expected, as I had been in and out of hospitals for many months, visiting the two of them. In their wills, I was left the house as I was their only child. It took me quite a while to come to terms with their deaths, especially living in the house that we had spent so much time together in. Although difficult, I did eventually accept the situation, and it became a whole lot easier to cope. The house itself no longer reminded me of their deaths, but instead reminded me of little memories here and there that would put a smile on my face. Sometimes I would even walk into the living room and see my dad sitting on the chair, smoking a cigarette and watching TV. 
I would sometimes still see my mom cooking in the kitchen and getting ready for dinner. These were the little things that kept me going each day. I actually enjoyed living in that house again, until one day. I had just gotten home from work when it happened. I sat down in my dad's chair and flipped on the TV to unwind. A thought then crossed my mind, aside from the tobacco. I had actually become my father. Thinking of that actually made me smile. And this is when I heard an all-too-familiar scratching noise coming from the pantry door in the kitchen. My smile quickly vanished. I jumped up and walked out to the kitchen to investigate. The scratching continued and became louder. I looked at the pantry door, hoping an answer would jump out at me, but also hoping that whatever was in there wouldn't do the same. Of course, neither of these things happened, forcing me to actually open the door. I hesitantly did so as the scratching went on. Much to my anticipation, the noises ceased, and I found nothing behind the door but empty shelves and an old broom. This is exactly what happened when my mom opened the door years ago. She, however, had the shelves fully stocked. I think I subliminally stayed away from the pantry, having been so scared of it as a child. My food remained in the cabinets and fridge, with absolutely nothing in the pantry itself. I was no longer a frightened child, but the return of the scratching noises was still unsettling, not to mention bothersome. I didn't hear it for years before this, but now it happened every day, like clockwork. As soon as I got home from work, there was scratching. Sometimes I would even wake up in the middle of the night to the sound of it. It would not stop until I opened the pantry door. Then, of course, the noise would cease, and I would find nothing behind the door. This routine continued for almost a year, but one night something changed. I was lying in bed trying to sleep when the scratching sound started up once more. I groaned in anger, not wishing to leave the comfort of my bed for anything, much less that damn noise. Because of this, I did not get up right away to open the pantry door. I just laid there as tired as ever. After a few minutes, something odd happened. The sound of scratching had stopped. Now, don't get me wrong, this was great. I didn't want to leave my bed anyhow, but the noise had never done this before. I was curious as to why. I got up out of bed and ventured down to the kitchen on the hunt for answers. What I saw alarmed me. The pantry door was wide open. This could not be. I had shut it earlier that night when I got home from work, the first time I heard the noise that day. I quickly turned the pantry light on to reveal absolutely nothing. For the first time since I was a child, I was frightened of the monster living in the pantry. Whatever it actually was, I think it had escaped. I scoured the house in fear for almost an hour, looking for whatever it was that had gotten loose. I was scared, actually scared. After going through every last room in the house, I took a deep breath and collected my thoughts. What was I doing? This was ridiculous. I was on the hunt for something imaginary. Sure, there was scratching on the door every night, but maybe it was a large rat or a raccoon. Maybe I actually did leave the door open the last time I heard the noise. Who knows? I managed to calm myself down as I made my way back to the kitchen to close the pantry door. And that's when I noticed something that I had not seen previously. There were deep scratch marks on the inside of the door. Those were never there before. Even as a child, my mom had checked for any markings in the wood, and there were none. What was happening here? I backed up into the living room in awe, keeping my eyes on the pantry door and its mysterious scratch marks. I rubbed my eyes a few times to make sure I wasn't seeing things. I even pinched myself to make sure I wasn't dreaming. Surely enough, it was all too real, and I had no explanation for it. After a few more seconds of private confusion, I watched as a figure ran into the pantry at high speed and shut the door behind it. I was flabbergasted. I couldn't make out what the figure was, but I ran over to the pantry and opened the door to find out. 
With my heart racing, I opened the door and turned the light on. Once again, I found nothing. I quickly shut off the light, shut the door, and piled a bunch of stuff in front of it, including my dad's chair. I ran up to my bed and hid under my covers as if I was a kid again, scared to death of the monster living in my mom's pantry. My late-night adventure had come to an end. After the adrenaline and fear tapered off, I was able to get some sleep. I woke up and pretended that nothing had happened the previous night. I just did what I usually did, put on my clothes, brushed my teeth, ate some breakfast, and headed off to work. I tried to keep the pantry and its resident as far from my thoughts as possible. Throughout the day, I found it hard to focus. I could barely function properly, let alone get any work done. My boss noticed this and asked me if I wanted to leave early and get some rest. I almost shouted the word no at him, begging him to let me stay. I wanted to be nowhere near my house. Luckily, he obliged. Even though I was able to stay at work, I had to clock out eventually. Despite my tiredness, the day went by too quickly, and I found myself home once again. I dreaded it. Even the memories of my parents could not help me now. I wanted nothing to do with this cursed house anymore. Despite my inner outburst, I still opened the front door and walked in. I was greeted with the sound of scratching. At this time, it was louder than it ever had been before. The scratching quickly turned into a thunderous banging at the pantry door. The things I had piled in front of it were actually moving a bit. Whatever it was that was in there really wanted to get out this time. I was as scared as I'd been the night before, but I was also sick of the ordeal. I was being pushed beyond my means, and I needed it all to stop. I walked over to the pantry and removed the items I'd piled in front of it. The banging continued. It took a moment to mentally prepare myself. After a few seconds, I swung the door open. There, sitting behind the door, was a dog. It just sat there and looked up at me in confusion. I looked at it in the same manner. How could this be? After giving me a once-over, the dog walked over to me and nuzzled up against my leg. Naturally, I reached down and petted it, just like I would a normal dog. This dog was not normal. After a few minutes of getting to know each other, the dog walked back into the pantry and vanished before my very eyes. It, it was a ghost. My fear was no longer existent. I would come home to the sound of scratching at the pantry door, and I would smile. I now opened the door, not to see nothing behind it, but instead to let my new friend out. He'd walk around the house and explore like a normal dog, and he would even sit down and watch television with me from time to time. Whenever someone came over, however, he would vanish. He seemed to be the shy type. The house was pretty old and had quite a few owners before my parents, so I assume this little guy was the ghost of a dog that previously lived here. I guess he just couldn't let go of the place. Neither could I, especially now. After a few weeks of playing and bonding with the dog, I realized I had nothing to call him. I walked over to him and began petting him on the neck. That was his favorite spot. I thought about it for a moment and then came up with the perfect name. I will call you... Monster. I've always considered myself to be a good dad. Patient, understanding, a good communicator, and strict but fair. That's how I wanted to be with my own boy as he grew up. It's never that simple, though, is it? You always have this image in your mind of how it will be when you're idly thinking about fatherhood or seriously thinking about it with your partner. But when it actually comes along and they aren't the picturesque baby that you envisioned, you realize the world you had in your head comes crashing down and you're going to fuck up on more than one occasion. 
Most dads don't sit at their son's hospital beds praying for their recovery as a result of these fuck-ups, though. To explain how we got to this point, I have to take you back to my childhood. I was around 10, and my mom and dad had grounded me for TPing Mr. Watterson's house again and ordered me to clear out the attic, finding things old and new to sell for a yard sale as a way of ensuring that I would learn from my error in judgment. I still thought what I'd done was hilarious. Mr. Watterson was a dick, but it definitely taught me to resist the urge in the future after saying goodbye to my Nintendo. While clearing out some of the contents of my back heirlooms, I stumbled across one of those old Japanese dolls known as a bunraku. It was at least a hundred years old, the paint smeared and cracked around the edges, the flesh-colored skin giving way to a more rotten wooden hue. My grandfather must have gotten it in Japan during the war, because my dad had no patience for cultural knickknacks, and I knew my mom would hate this sort of thing after seeing Chucky. His name was Mr. Promises, and the tag attached to it, written in crude English, read, A companion for all time. He will fulfill any promise you have with only one string attached. I looked down and saw that someone had affixed a pull string to him clearly long after he was finished. I rolled my eyes at the terrible pun and pulled the string. It extended out farther than I was expecting before hitting the snag and reversing back slowly. Then, a raspy but authoritative voice rang out. Greetings. Have you a wish? Most fortunate. Mr. Promises shall carry it out. Simply speak the name of your ire and pull the string for that fulfilled desire. I shrugged, thought of how Mr. Watterson had seen me throwing the toilet paper over his house that night, and in my ten-year-old brain, blamed him for me getting into trouble. So I pulled the string once more and said, Mr. Bill Watterson. A sharp sound of a Japanese taiko drum being hit rang out, and the doll moved to assume a prayer position. Mr. Promises has carried out your wish. Now you must fulfill my own. Pull the string to finish this deal and begin to atone. Forget this, I scoffed, putting the doll back into the box and going back to cleaning the attic. After an hour or so, I went downstairs to tell my mom and dad I'd finished, but I didn't find them in the kitchen. Instead, I noticed our front door was ajar, and the two of them were standing in shock as blue flashing lights and several police cars and ambulances sat with their engines running. The police took strategic positions behind their cars, aiming at the front door, the curtains half-drawn, blood spattering the edges. Dad, what's going on? I walked up and stood slightly back from the gap between them, the feeling of danger in the air. Looks like Mr. Watterson has uh, had an uh, issue with his wife, and the police were called. He shifted and looked at me, smiling. I'm sure it'll be fine, buddy. (laughs) Head on up to your room. I was about to turn around when Mr. Watterson's blood-covered sweater caught my eye as he stumbled into view, leaning against the doorframe with the blood of his wife coating his face. Shaking, he held a 12-gauge shotgun in his free hand and had an almost trance-like state in his eyes. As he pulled the door open, it revealed the twitching body of his wife lying in their hallway. Mr. Watterson, drop your weapon and put your hands up now or we'll be forced to shoot, the officer called back as the men beside him held their guns steadily. Is it... is it done? His timid voice called back, the fear obvious even from this distance. Is what done, Mr. Watterson? The officer replied. No sooner had he done so, his deputy screamed, Don't! Mr. Watterson stood for a moment, his body shaking from side to side before nodding, and in one swift motion, raised the shotgun up to his lips, pulling the trigger and spraying brain matter across his doorframe. In a sea of viscera and confetti, his body standing for a moment before slumping forward in a sickening thud. While the whole incident was burned into my brain, despite my mom and dad attempting to shield me in vain, it wasn't the gore and the violence that scarred me. No, it was something far more disturbing than that. It was the far-off look in Mr. Watterson's eyes and where they were directed that shook me. 
they were looking into my attic. Naturally, after I calmed down and composed myself, I tried to talk to my father about the doll I found in the attic, but he dismissed it immediately. Mr. Watterson had problems and they got to him, Jacob, nothing more. It was all I could get out of him before the issue became borderline taboo to discuss. My family would never speak of it again, and subsequently it was forgotten, relegated to a subject that we dared not discuss lest the awkward silence fill the air and ruin any future gatherings. Time passes, the street moves on, and someone else fills the house the Watersons once occupied. I get older, and as is tradition, move out as my life takes me to opportune places. I'd say it's been about 30 years since that summer afternoon, and it wasn't something I gave much thought about until I returned to my family home with a new generation in tow. My father had recently died and my mother was now in palliative care, so it was up to me and my son to take over the house. I separated from my wife, so this was seen as making the best of a bad situation. My son Isaac was initially unhappy to be moving across state and changing schools, but he warmed up to the idea when I promised him pizza every night for the first week we were there. He was a good kid my spitting image, right down to his precocious nature and the freckles on his nose. I began unpacking everything in the home and separating all of our things. I must admit that it was hard to see my entire life in just a few moving boxes, the entirety of an irretrievable marriage carelessly thrown in with mismatched objects. I loved my wife Sadie, but her drinking was getting the better of her judgment. After coming home from work to discover Isaac with a cut on his forehead caused by falling through the coffee table and a blackout drunk Sadie in the bedroom, I decided enough was enough. The proceedings didn't take long and I was awarded full custody. I promised her we'd visit if she went to a rehab center and I left soon after. If Isaac felt anything, he didn't show it. But I did my best to communicate with him on a grown-up level, knowing full well that kids pick up on far more than we realize. Like any seven-year-old, though, his mind was easily fixated on the next important thing in his immediacy, and while initially it was making friends or liking his room, it rapidly shifted to picking out where he wanted to put his bed and toys. His energy was infectious, and I told him to go pick out any room he wanted, hoping it might make him settle in easier. A few hours passed and the unpacking was mostly done, but I hadn't heard anything from Isaac the entire time. Curious, I scoured the house looking for him, wondering where he might be. I heard him laughing above me and felt uneasy as I could hear it coming from the attic. I turned down the hall and saw the hatch to it was wide open, an oversight on the cleaner's part, I imagined. Ascending the stairs, Isaac's voice rang out clearer, and what I was hearing made the hairs on my neck stand on end. So what do I call you? My name is Isaac Fitzroy, he said with that ever-present enthusiasm. The sound of a cord being pulled cut through the air before a horribly familiar voice replied back. Mr. Promises, have you a wish to be fulfilled? It sounded exactly the same from my childhood. But was the phrase always that short? Before Isaac could reply, I reached the top of the steps and my son turned to me, smiling. I tried to feign happiness, forcing the edges of my smile to curl up in spite of my fear. Hey, bud. Uh, who are you talking to? I asked, knowing full well the response I was about to receive. He's called Mr. Promises, Dad. Is this one of your toys? He beamed at me, clutching the ever-disturbing Bunraku doll tightly in his hand. I shook my head, the request that he leave it alone about to leave my mouth when he interjected, Can I keep him, Dad? He seems really cool. You have to understand, my incident was a long time ago, to the point where, in that moment, I was, as an adult, willing to do what most of us do when we're confronted with uncomfortable truths. Push it to the back of my mind and lie to myself. So when my son 
who had just left his old life and mom behind, wanted a keepsake to make him happy. Well, who was I to refuse? I nodded and told him if he helped me with the last of the unpacking, he could keep him. He was overjoyed and agreed. The next few days were relatively peaceful. We got on with our lives, and it seemed that Isaac was adjusting well. I'd occasionally catch him talking to the doll as if it were an imaginary friend, but the conversations always seemed to fall within the realms of what a kid usually talked about when playing, so I didn't really think much of it. I'll admit, when hearing Mr. Promise's voice lines in response, it was almost comical. Isaac needed the confidence boost, and if that was found within a creepy doll from my childhood, well, that was fine with me. His happiness was most important. Over time, though, I began to observe small changes in him. Things that at first didn't fall out of the ordinary spectrum of misbehavior. Breaking a toy in a fit of anger or throwing a tantrum because something didn't go his way. And in those cases, I'd just sit him down and talk to him about how he felt, which ended with a hug and an apology. But then things, shall we say, escalated. He would punch holes in the drywall, break his furniture, and even throw rocks at stray animals. Every time I confronted him about it, he would tell me that Mr. Promises told him to do it, and that it was part of his secret game. When I pressed him for more information, he would look up to his room where Mr. Promises resided, look back to me, and shake his head slowly and intentionally. This frustrated me, but as a single parent trying to adjust to a new life, all I felt I could do was talk to him and try and take away anything he loved for a short period of time. Last week, however, two things happened that would change the very course of our lives. First, in a completely out of the blue attack, he bit the babysitter while I was at work and did enough damage that she had to be sent to the hospital. I was furious when I got the news and took him immediately from our neighbor's house back to our living room to scold him. But even my anger couldn't match his, as he kicked the walls openly, trying to throw anything he could get his hands on. It was only when his eyes darted to the top of the stairs that he completely fell inert, his entire demeanor shifting and becoming that of a timid boy once again. I lost. I lost the game. He's going to be so mad at me, Dad. I'm sorry. Please don't punish me, he begged. I was confused but eager to help him no matter the cost or the stress. I'm not going to punish you harshly, Isaac, but you have to apologize to the babysitter, okay? And what game are you playing? I held his shoulders and made sure. I looked him in the eye when I asked, fearing someone was putting pressure on him to misbehave without my realizing it. I'll tell her I'm sorry, but I'm not being punished by you, he replied, his voice shaking. I'm being punished by Mr. Promises. I can't tell you about the game. I'll... I'll get in more trouble. Alarm bells now ringing, I sat on the floor and ran my hand through his hair to placate him, promising him he'd be safe with me if he just trusted me. You do trust me, right? I asked, hoping that things weren't any worse than what I already feared. It took a moment, but sheepishly, he put a small note in my hands before looking back at the floor with the words, the road to promises written in crude black crayon on the front. Sensing his shame, I decided not to make him stand there while I read the note. Go get ready for bed, buddy. I'll come tuck you in. Everything will be okay, I promise. He nodded, walking off to the stairs and repeatedly saying I'm sorry under his breath. While he was out of view, I opened the note and felt the bile rise in my throat at every sentence. The Road to Promises Mr. Promises is doing this for your own good. Follow the instructions like any good boy should. Every 12 hours there will be a new challenge, and for every challenge that you succeed, I will bring you closer to what you need. For every challenge you fail, a punishment you will entail. The game starts now, but do not fret. All pain is temporary. Yours hasn't happened yet. Your finest possession you must break, for we truly grow when our hearts begin to ache. 
when the penultimate game is done, pass this to the father with love from the son. Mr. Promises will be waiting, Elder Fitzroy. Will you be participating? My hands shook as I gripped the letter, but I decided acting now would be too much for him and that it was better to deal with in the morning. I sat with him and read his favorite stories until he finally fell asleep, still occasionally telling me he was sorry under his breath. As I left, I saw Mr. Promises sitting on his shelf, looking down and across the room at the sleeping Isaac. Disgust filled me, and I took him quietly from Isaac's room and put him back in the attic for the night, electing to tell Isaac that he'd gone missing, Everything in me was screaming to keep him away from my son until I understood what he was. At least I could put him far away from his prying hands. Settling in for bed that night, I had no idea the mistake I'd made. It was a few hours later when I woke to the sound of a soft scraping coming from somewhere in the house. Being a parent and coupled with recent events, my mind immediately went to the worst-case scenario and I leapt out of bed and listened intently for the sound again. It was coming from below me. I followed it down towards the kitchen and the sounds became more intense, the scraping accompanied by whimpering. Turning the corner, I was greeted with the horrifying sight of my son running a blade across the back of a stray cat. The blood dripped from multiple deep lacerations and coated the white floor in a vivid crimson. If the cat was alive when Isaac started cutting it, it certainly wasn't now. The limp and emaciated creature sprawled out on the floor as Isaac dutifully carved segments of it off with the carving knife, his face transfixed, eyes almost hollow as he continued. Isaac! Isaac, what the hell are you doing? I tried to contain myself, but urgency and shock overcame me as my voice began to rise. His arm stopped as he was bringing the knife down again, and he remained still. The entire atmosphere was tense. He was just a boy, but I knew I had to be careful with how I approached this, especially when he had a weapon. There was something else I couldn't shake there in the dead of night. I felt like I had to be on guard, not just from my son, but from something else. Isaac, look at me, son. I need you to listen. I began, crouching down to his level but keeping a safe distance, my voice lowering back to a calm state. We can talk about this, and I promise you that I won't get mad, but you have to put the knife down, okay? I took a small shuffle forward and I heard the smallest of cracks. Isaac's finger shot up from his free hand and pointed towards me, wagging in place as if to ward me away. Was my son in a trance? He'd never shown this kind of behavior before, save for the occasional nightmare. Isaac, is someone putting you up to this? Are they here with you? I asked softly, another step forward and focused on keeping the atmosphere calm. He sat near the center of the kitchen and I wasn't able to spot what was behind the island. When he nodded though, I stopped moving and I felt my muscles tighten. My cell was upstairs, and I had no weapons on me. The alarm hadn't gone off, and there were no signs of a break-in. It was... He started, but a gruff voice rang out from behind him. Young Fitzroy, that would be most unadvisable. Our game is not yet done. Speak out now, and Mr. Promises will hold you liable. Remember, you have not yet won. Isaac fell silent again and tears began to run down his face, smearing the floor and causing ripples in the blood as it made contact. My blood ran cold, and the feeling of danger mounted with every second I kept my son near that godforsaken doll. Where is he, Isaac? Another step, and I'm within arm's reach. Where's Mr. Promises? Isaac shook his head, whimpering and muttering, No, I can't under his breath and with more and more panic, each time his voice cracking a little more. It's okay, buddy. We'll get through this, I promise. I began to reach out slowly for the knife when a sick laugh emanated from behind the counter, the sound of the cord reverting. Now, the voice bellowed as Isaac lunged forward and drove the knife into my shoulder. Pain erupted through my body as my vision began to blur 
and the sight of my son's anguish-ridden face inches from mine intermixed as he pushed me to the ground, pinning the knife into me before running towards the door. Upside down, I could still see his blurred visage as he pulled the door to a close and whispered, I'm so sorry, Dad, before letting it shut. Long have I waited, patiently with breath so baited. Elder Fitzroy, you made a promise. It's true. Now... I heard the clicking and scraping of wood as something began lumbering from behind the counter, out of my vision and towards me. One hand gripped my leg and then the other pulled itself up my torso, the clicking getting louder as it reached my neck, a pair of spindly hands pulling on my chin before a twisted, demonic face glared down at me. Gone were the human features of the Bunraco doll, instead replaced with pale skin yellow piercing eyes, and an unhinged jaw filled with rows of small black teeth. Now you must fulfill your promise before the night is through. Your son's final challenge, that is already due. Its jaw crunched and clicked horrifically as it threatened to get closer, the raspy laughter filling the kitchen. The pain in my chest was nothing compared to the sheer terror running through my mind in that moment. Out of fear or stupidity, I swatted the puppet away with everything I had, pulling the knife from my shoulder and rushing towards the door, slamming it shut behind me. The instinctual fear of a parent overcame me. I ran straight to Isaac's room and I saw the door was shut and not budging. I knocked frantically for Isaac to open up, but there was no reply. Every eventual horrific outcome filled my mind as the cackling from downstairs continued. I looked around for something tangible to help me bust the door open when my eyes fell on the bathroom door. It was ajar. Oh no. No, 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 I began my anxiety building as I rushed to confirm my worst suspicions. The medicine cabinet had been raided. I took a couple of steps back and rammed my body into the door with full force, but it barely budged my shoulder rushing with pain. No matter, try again. I reared back and through gritted teeth pushed again, the door giving way as I stumbled through. In the corner lay my boy, a half-empty bottle of pills on its side, and his body twitching. I called the ambulance in a haze and watched as they took him away, not even having the energy to ask to sit in the ambulance with him. I felt like I'd failed him completely as a father. A neighbor drove me to the hospital where I sat, waiting to see my boy. I decided to use that time to call our family and let them know what happened. While my wife didn't pick up, my mother did. The moment I heard her voice, I felt the walls coming down and everything that I'd bottled up rushed to the surface. As the fear of what was going on overwhelmed me. Mom? Isaac? Isaac isn't doing so well, I began trying to keep my composure. He's taken a bunch of pills and, well, he's not been all right for a couple of weeks. I'm not sure why. Honey, I'm sure you're doing your best with him. Adjustments can be tough. It was hard on you too back then, she soothed, trying her best to be comforting from a distance. You were never the same after Danny died. Danny? Who's Danny, Mom? I asked, hoping she wasn't about to slip into a forgetful patch. I knew she couldn't help it, but I needed my mom at that moment. There was a pause before she replied. Danny Waterson, your best friend. You used to see him every day, until that summer afternoon when Bill did what he did. We should have never let you go to his house. Your father blamed himself for that until his dying day, you know. My stomach contracted and my hand shook as I held the phone to my ear. Ma, I I was home when that happened. I stood behind you and Dad when it all went down because I I was I was cleaning out the attic. Remember? I, I put toilet paper on Mr. Watterson's house because no, honey. You were at their house because he told us that you could help him clean the house as punishment. Danny did it as a prank. You offered to help your best friend. You were in the house that day when Bill... I began to feel sick. I began to remember things that I'd long blocked out. Danny showing me the doll from his attic. 
him wishing his dad was dead so he wouldn't put his hands on him again. The ensuing violence when I hid upstairs and clutched Mr. Promises. And then I recalled the moment I heard the gunshots. The visceral shriek from Danny's mom as she was blasted point blank in the face, her brain matter splattering across the walls. The sounds Danny made as he was dragged from the top of the stairs near the attic entrance to his room, a pillow placed over him followed by a muffled gunshot. A manic voice ringing out as he called for me, blood-covered shotgun in hand while I'd sat motionless in his attic. I remembered Mr. Promises being next to me. I remembered pulling the cord and wishing to survive beyond anything else. Mr. Promises clapped his hands together, and in that moment, I forgot ever being in the house. I forgot Danny, and I continued my life as normal. But I never fulfilled my end of the bargain. Mom? Uh, I, I gotta go. I'll call you as soon as I know more, okay? Thank you. My throat was dry and I felt my vision blurring from the stress. I put the phone down before I could even hear her reply and sought out the doctor. Is he safe? Is my boy safe? I asked, panic, riddling my voice as I controlled every impulse not to rush into the room he was being attended to. You're lucky you got him here when you did, Mr. Fitzroy. Any more pills or any longer and this might have turned out differently. Her kind eyes put me at ease, but I knew something worse was waiting for me. He's not ready for visitors right now. I would go home if I were you, sir, and we can call you when he's ready. I took her hands in both of mine, tears of relief and of fear filling up as I thanked her profusely. The moment he's awake, or if anything happens, I began, my voice breaking. Yes, we will call you. She smiled back. I left the hospital not knowing if it was the last time I would see my son or not, but knowing that the old saying rang truer in that moment than ever before. The sins of the father often do haunt the son. The house was a different entity entirely when I returned, the safety of it as a child and as a parent totally gone. Windows felt like soulless black eyes, the door still slightly ajar like an inviting mouth, and every step I took felt like I was simply prey, waiting to be devoured by whatever horror lurked there. The lights were off and I could see my own dried blood in the hall, a handprint on the stairway and a trail leading from the kitchen. The door now open. It felt wrong to even be here, but I knew that this had to be done. My son's life was more important than my selfish fears and desires to avoid the responsibility I set out all those years ago. Mr. Promises? I will fulfill my end of the bargain, I called out, still somehow feeling ridiculous talking to a goddamn puppet. But after everything I'd seen, it was a small price to pay. The Elder Fitzroy has returned. Fulfill his promise, lest a liar get burned, he jeered his voice echoing around the house and bouncing off of every corner. Thirty years late, this fulfillment will be. What will you do if that's not enough for me? I paused. I had no idea what he would even want in return. I didn't know if this would be a fair trade or not. Danny wished for his dad to never lay his hands on him again. Though he got his wish, it came at the cost of his life. Would my wish ultimately have that end, too? What did my son ask you for, I called out, Mr. Promises giggling. He wanted his family to be closer, more secure, so I presented him with a route to ensure that forevermore. I saw a figure move frantically in the corner of my eye. In death, your grief would rekindle your love. Your son could indulge, too, looking on from above. It seemed no matter what way I looked at it, this was not a simple trade-off. Something had to give. But as I said, I consider myself a good parent, and that means that sacrifice is necessary, right? Whatever it takes, I will fulfill my promise, I replied, standing firm but internally shaking, terrified of what my life would be without my son. Consider it done, Elder Fitzroy. But if I were you, I'd keep an eye on your boy. 
He was right behind me. His voice sounded so real. I could hear the dulcet tones, but no breath. I dared not turn around. I may return one day for a new generation to see. Well, you know what they say. The apple rarely falls far from the rotten tree. It was another three days before Isaac woke up. The doctor said he was lucky to not have sustained any long-term damage from the pills he ingested. Though he is still suffering with mild amnesia and doesn't recall much of the last few weeks, he wasn't even sure why we were in this city and after seeing me, the first thing he asked me was, Where's mom? Suffice it to say, it's not going to be an easy road. I don't know what Mr. Promises is, and I don't know where he went after that deal was struck, but I never heard from him again, nor did he show up in the house. I got my son back, and I wouldn't trade that for any knowledge of what that monster was, so I'll stick with the blessing I have. Speaking of Isaac, the hardest thing wasn't explaining how he got to the hospital or the injuries he had. No, it was telling him that his grandma had passed away while he was asleep. He just couldn't fathom where she had gone and what had happened to her. Though truth be told, I think it's best he simply thinks she's somewhere peaceful. A secret I will have to bear for the rest of my life. I hope that Mr. Promises doesn't one day pay a visit to Isaac when he's older. As the saying goes... Like father, like son. Living in the town of Findlay, you hear a lot of urban legends. Scary stories and rumors. Usually conjured up to convince the young kids to behave and not stay out past their bedtimes. As I understand it, it wasn't always this way. We moved to town two months ago in mid-August and immediately it became apparent that Findlay took this time of year really seriously. Apparently, it's coming up on two years, almost to the day, since a small string of seemingly random murders occurred here, all over the course of a week. All the flags in town are lowered to half-mast, and candles and flowers have been piled up in front of a memorial to the victims in the town square. My mother and I haven't paid this much mind, it's sad, sure, but we've just been busy trying to acclimate to our new surroundings. Last Saturday afternoon, we spent a few hours perusing the garage sales in our neighborhood, looking for antiques and interesting Halloween decorations. We came upon a yard that was rather sparse in their offerings. They had some cardboard boxes of books, a rack of old clothes, and an interesting-looking scarecrow sitting in a chair by the house. It had a sign tacked to its threadbare overalls. Five dollars. Intrigued, I made my way over to it, and was examining it with interest when a teenager approached me, also looking at the scarecrow. She seemed really nervous, and wouldn't take her eyes off the thing. Hi, do you live here? I asked, gesturing to the house. This is a really cool scarecrow, super vintage. She shook her head furiously. No, I, I live down the street. I just wanted to... You're new here, right? New to town? I nodded, a puzzled smile on my face. <laughs> yeah. Why? Just... You shouldn't buy that scarecrow, okay? You should leave it be. Haven't you heard the story? She said in a hushed voice. I glanced back at my mother, who was browsing through the boxes of books, sending her, help me, in my eyes in case this girl was a little unhinged. Uh, no. What story? She leaned in and proceeded to tell me the story that I've transcribed below to the best of my ability. The Murphy family prided themselves on a few important aspects of their modest middle-class Midwestern life. They rooted for their hometown football team even when they were playing awfully, which was most of the time. They insisted on eating dinner together as a family at least five nights per week with no cell phones allowed at the table. And every year, they constructed the best Halloween yard display in the entire town. It was something Jack's grandparents had begun with him and his siblings when they were still small. And he grew up knowing that he would show his own kids the joy of spending a month setting up fake coffins filled with rubber mummies and half-decomposed zombies. 
After the family dinner, but before it started to get dark, they would haul in the props and decorations from their storage shed and begin the painstaking process of arranging them in an expansive front yard. Gallons of fake blood would be spilled and countless bags of fluffy spider webs would be stretched across every tree and bush. Over decades of improvements, the display had grown from a small cluster of foam headstones with a few green hands protruding from the ground into a massive, fenced-off haunted experience, complete with fog machines and sound effects. The surrounding neighborhoods came to expect this wonderland of horror and looked forward to it. Watching the Murphys begin to build it on October 1st and excitedly standing in line to tour it on Halloween night. Lana, the youngest Murphy child, had even made them a modest Facebook page to attract more attention. The spooky tour itself took roughly 5 to 10 minutes, depending on how quickly the group moved across the yard. The display was arranged with only one entrance and one exit. It was barricaded on all other sides, so the only way to escape was to finish walking through it, much like any traditional haunted house. The three kids took turns dressing up as voodoo dolls, murder victims, or demonic clowns to jump out from behind the various props to terrify the visitors. At the end of the tour, everyone would receive their fair share of candy and orange pumpkin-shaped stickers that read, I survived the Murphy Horror House, followed by the respective year. A great time was had by all, and Jack felt pride in knowing he was making his late grandparents proud. The display would vary slightly from year to year, depending on the latest and scariest props that Daisy, Jack's wife, had either scavenged from the after Halloween sales last season or created from scratch. A group of witches huddled over a cauldron might end the tour rather than the traditional chainsaw-wielding madman. A gravedigger might be on the left side rather than the right to accommodate creepier additions. As props were added, some were inevitably retired. Countless years of sitting out in the elements had begun to wear them down. But one part of the display would never change. Not if Jack had anything to say about it. In the very center of the tour, illuminated by green and orange spotlights and hung askew on a rugged cross-like post, was the Scarecrow. Jack made that Scarecrow himself when he was 11 years old. Together with his father, he gathered the hay and bits of old fabric necessary to bring it to life, and it had appeared in their display ever since. The burlap sack that comprised the Scarecrow's face was tattered and full of moth holes, but it still bore its signature crooked smile stitched in black yarn and curling up a bit too far on either side. It wore an old straw hat, a denim work shirt that once belonged to his father, patched overalls, and a pair of dusty boots. Its hair was an unruly black wig that Jack's mother had found at a garage sale, sticking out from under its hat in all directions. And its eyes were painted on, dark red triangles sunken into its face. The Scarecrow was always the first to go up when the display construction began, and the last to come down, in an almost ceremonial fashion. It was the centerpiece of the whole production, even if most of the trick-or-treaters didn't find it scary anymore, not compared to the more modern, detailed props. Jack didn't care. The Scarecrow ruled over the yard like a king, reminding everyone of where the tradition began. That year, it was a week before Halloween, and the display was almost complete. Lana, Ryan, and Trevor had long since given up on decorating and were inside, busy arguing over who would get to dress up as Jason from Friday the 13th. Jack was doing what he always did as the big night drew closer, walking the whole display over and over, checking to see that everything worked and nothing should be tweaked. The sun had sunk below the horizon, and Daisy was calling him to come in, but Jack insisted on one last stroll with his flashlight in hand, Rolling her eyes at her obsessive husband, Daisy relented, and retreated inside to stop her children from killing each other over a costume. Jack entered through the stone gate at the entrance to the tour and followed the path as it wound back and forth through the yard. Occasionally, he would stop to scoot a rubber rat out of the walkway with a shoe or arrange a bloody vampire so its eyes caught the light a bit better. In general, all seemed to be in order. The excitement of knowing it was almost showtime put a skip in Jack's step. He came around the corner to where the scarecrow was set up, and at first, he thought his eyes might be playing tricks on him in the dim light. The spotlights that usually illuminated the scarecrow were turned off. That in itself was odd, as all the lights were on the same circuit, and the other lights were still blazing around him. Even in the shadowy darkness, 
it quickly became apparent that the wooden cross that held his old friend was empty. Daisy! Jack bellowed, spinning in circles and shining his flashlight every which way as if to catch the thief. Daisy poked her head out of the front door. You rang? She replied with more exasperation than concern. The scarecrow! It, it's gone! Someone took it! Jack shouted. He was now sprinting toward the end of the maze, checking behind every grave and looking in the front and back of an old hearse. He was sure someone was still lurking inside the display, snickering at his distress. I'm sure nobody took it, dear. You probably just left it somewhere, Daisy sighed. Jack ran up to her, panting from exertion. You know it's the first thing I put up. I saw it less than 20 minutes ago. It was there the last time I walked the maze, he protested, still shining the flashlight around behind the porch and into the dark stillness of the yard. Nothing else seemed to miss. It's just some neighborhood kids playing tricks on us. I'm sure they'll bring it back. We'll arm the alarm system tonight before bed, Daisy replied, taking her husband by the elbow and gingerly guiding him inside. She didn't completely understand his fixation with the scarecrow, but she hadn't seen him this upset in quite some time. Okay, he said with a huff, clearly not placated. And that was what they did. The alarm system covered the entire yard, from the end of the driveway and back to the house. It was a simple motion-activated number. Anything larger than a squirrel would set it off with blaring sirens and flashing lights. Because of this, they only ever armed it during the month of October, and only for the two weeks leading up to Halloween when most of the expensive props were put out. They had been awoken abruptly more than once in the past years because someone's dog got loose and triggered it accidentally. That night, however... The alarm did not go off, and in the morning, Jack awoke bright and early from a restless sleep. He ran to their bedroom window and peered down. Their room was on the second floor and overlooked the front yard. Stunned, he could plainly see, even from a distance, that the scarecrow was back on its post. Its head was even drooping slightly to the right, just as he had left it the night before. How is this possible? Jack asked anxiously as they made breakfast later that morning and prepared to usher the kids off to school. Daisy shrugged, more focused on packing lunches than their conversation. Maybe you were mistaken. You said yourself the spotlights were off. No. I know what I saw. How did they get that scarecrow back on its post in the middle of the night without triggering the alarms? He demanded. It was baffling to him. The scarecrow was as big as a full-grown man and unwieldy to carry. He always needed his eldest son Ryan's help hanging it from the post, and he considered himself fairly fit. It must have taken at least two people to remove it and put it back. Maybe three if they were young teens. Yet none of them had heard a thing. Daisy stuffed a bagel in his mouth and handed him his coffee. Maybe the alarm system's faulty. We haven't used it in a year. I can have someone out to look at it tomorrow. Don't worry so much, Jack. You got what you wanted. It's back, isn't it? She reminded him. He was about to argue further when the sound of the morning news distracted them both. Lana turned up the volume on the TV in the living room and the rest of the family slowly congregated around it. Tragedy struck in Findlay last night when 12-year-old Marla Greenberg was found murdered in her bed. We're still receiving details, but it appears she was... At this point, there was a pause as the newscaster swallowed thickly, his expression deeply uncomfortable disemboweled. Several of her internal organs are missing. There was no sign of forced entry and the police are investigating the entire Greenberg family. Finley PD has declined to offer any interviews and the family has asked for privacy during this difficult time. In shock and horror, Jack reached for the remote, taking it from Lana and changing the channel before the news story could continue. Oh my god, Daisy cried her hands flying up to her lips and her eyes welling with tears. I know Marla. She's in Trevor's class. Oh, her poor parents. For all you know, her poor parents are the ones who killed her, Ryan said with no small amount of snark. Trevor nodded his agreement, forever mimicking his older brother, and Lana just rolled her eyes. Daisy shushed them, still fighting back tears. Jack was also thoroughly shaken by this, although he tried not to show it. Nothing like this ever happened in their city. There were mostly happy, 
pleasant people here. The strange events from the previous night, combined with this latest development, added to the heavy sense of unease that was building in his gut. He couldn't shake the feeling that something was very, very wrong. They hurried the kids off to school with multiple reminders to be careful and hurry home. As soon as the bus drove off down the street, Jack called the alarm company and scheduled maintenance for the following afternoon. Whatever was going on, nobody was setting foot in their yard again without them knowing it. That night, it took Jack hours to fall asleep. The kids had all come home from school raving about Marla Greenberg's murder and spouting several theories their friends had told them. Try as he might to change the subject at dinner, it was all any of them wanted to talk about. Jack supposed he understood. Marla had been their age. <laughs> they must be frightened that something might happen to them too. The creepy time of year did nothing to help the situation. It all fed right into their mounting Halloween hysteria. After spending hours tossing and turning in bed, mulling it all over in his mind, he decided to give up and go get a glass of water from the kitchen. As he rose from the bed and passed by the bedroom window, something outside caught his eye. He hurried over and looked down into the yard, rubbing his eyes to make sure he was actually seeing what he thought he was seeing. The scarecrow was gone again! His hands gripped the windowsill tightly, his knuckles turning white. It was everything he could do not to wake Daisy. He knew she would write it off as another neighborhood prank, cite the broken alarm system as the culprit, and assure him it would be fixed the next day. The straps that held the scarecrow to its post were loose and waving gently in the nighttime breeze, and he could barely make out little bits of hay leading off in the direction of the exit. Part of him wanted to sit on the front porch with a baseball bat and wait for the intruders to return, in case they decided to steal other props from them. But something about the whole situation gave him pause. Why would they bring the scarecrow back only to steal it again? Were they just messing with him? What were they doing with it? It didn't feel right. Reluctantly, he retrieved his glass of water and tried to go back to sleep. But this time he cracked the window open a few inches to better hear what was going on in the yard. He slept facing it. Jack woke hours later to the sun streaming in and Daisy shaking him roughly by the shoulder. Bewildered, he blinked his sleepy eyes open and stared up at her face. She looked extremely pale, and she had clearly been crying. Jack? It's happened again, she said quietly, her throat tight. Come downstairs. Not fully awake and barely understanding what she meant, he got up and reached for his bathrobe. In his haste, he forgot to glance out the window. The TV was blaring when they entered the living room. The kids were poised in a semicircle around it, frozen in place like statues as they watched the news story unfold. In a shocking turn of events, a second murder has taken place in Findlay roughly 24 hours after the first. The scene at 13-year-old Danielle LeBeau's bedside was equally grisly according to Findlay PD. This time the boy's heart and lungs were missing. Jack's own heart sunk into his stomach at these words. The image on screen showed crime scene tape crisscrossing the LeBeau's front door as paramedics loaded a covered body into the back of an ambulance. Possibly, most horrifying of all, they lived only two streets over from the Murphys. The Greenbergs at least lived on the other side of town. This was getting too close for comfort. Again, no sign of forced entry was found and the police are now convinced that this is the work of an organized, highly stealthy, and sadistic killer. Finley has decided to enforce a mandatory curfew of 9pm for all children under 18 until the perpetrator has been brought into custody. Daisy switched the TV off. This time, none of the kids cracked jokes, or even moved a muscle. Lana was quietly crying, and trying to hide it. Dad? Is someone gonna kill us too? Trevor asked with wide eyes, craning his head up to look at his father. Jack put a firm hand on the boy's head. No, Trev. I would never let anything happen to you guys. Jack, maybe we should keep them home from school today, Daisy said weakly. She looked like she might pass out. Jack shook his head. No, we don't put our lives on hold because some psycho is trying to scare everyone. That's just letting him win. The police are doing their jobs. We need to do ours. Guys, do you want to stay home? Three heads shook slowly from side to side. Most likely, they would feel safer in a school surrounded by plenty of adults and security supervision, not to mention all of their friends. Okay, 
Then let's get ready. No sooner had the words left his mouth than he thought he caught movement in his peripheral vision. Something was outside. He approached the picture window that faced the front yard and pushed the curtains further apart, expecting to see a bird or someone walking their dog. Everything was perfectly still in the Halloween display. Everything was as it should be. The scarecrow, he was no longer surprised to see, was once again back on its post, smiling merrily in the morning mist. Later that day, as the alarm system repairman wandered around their property checking on all the motion sensors and wiring, Jack took another stroll through the display and came to a stop in front of the scarecrow. He stared up at it, hands on his hips, brow furrowed deeply in thought. He had taken a day off work to be there when the maintenance guys came and was spending time trying to logically work through what could be happening on his property. He hadn't yet told Daisy about the Scarecrow's latest disappearing act. He wanted to solve the puzzle on his own, and he knew her answer would be, It was just a dream. If the alarm system had been broken for the last two days, he supposed it was possible that a few older kids had snuck into the yard and moved the Scarecrow. They must have moved quickly, especially last night. It disappeared and reappeared again within the span of, at most, three hours, by his estimation. Odd that even with the window open, he didn't hear them working. The straps that held its arms and waist to the post were literally nailed into the wood, so they would have needed to pull out the nails and then replace them afterward. How could they have not heard the sound of someone hammering? He walked a bit closer to the scarecrow, examining it. Something was off about it. He could see it now that he was up close. It seemed fuller than it usually was. Over many years, straw and stuffing had fallen out of its torso and limbs, and the kids had diligently packed it back in every other season or so. But even with occasional fixes, it was always rather slim. Now its chest and stomach seemed robust, as if it had been generously restuffed. He almost chuckled to himself. What was he really suggesting here? That some kids were stealing a scarecrow just to, what, refill it? Make it look nicer? It was a ridiculous notion. Daisy, or someone, had obviously come out and stuffed it a bit more last night before they went to bed. Sighing, Jack gave the old scarecrow a pat on the leg, and went to meet the alarm company guys at the other end of the yard. They were finishing up their assessment. Aha, Mr. Murphy, the lead worker said. He was scratching his head as he handed Jack a clipboard with some data and forms to sign. Strangest thing. Far as we can tell, your alarm system's in perfect working order. Jack froze, pen in hand. What do you mean? I mean, it works just fine, and always has. We can test it and show- Yes, please do. I need to know that it works. Jack interrupted, becoming somewhat hysterical now. So they did. They took turns walking through various parts of the yard with the system armed, and sure enough, it was quickly set off each time. They disarmed it immediately after every test, so as not to cause an uproar with the neighbors. Jack insisted they try walking through the display itself and up to the scarecrow, just to be sure. They didn't even make it halfway there before the sirens blared and the lights flashed. It doesn't make sense, Jack said under his breath, after a solid half hour of testing the alarm. Could the intruders possibly be disarming it and then arming it again when they leave? He asked the workers. He was now desperate to find an answer. Any kind of answer. Their leader shook his head. They'd need the passcode and access to the remote. There's no evidence that the system has been tampered with. He paused. Mr. Murphy, nothing is officially missing from your property, correct? He was looking at Jack with that suspicious side-eye that clearly indicated he was concerned about the man's mental health. Well, no. I mean, not right now, but then I wouldn't worry. If you have any other concerns, don't hesitate to call us again. That evening, as Jack was helping Daisy prepare dinner, and trying to figure out a way to discuss everything he had learned that day with her, he overheard the children gossiping amongst themselves in the living room. I heard that they didn't just take Danny's heart and lungs. They took some of his skin, too, Trevor was saying to Ryan and Lana. Shut up. That's gross and it's not true, Lana retorted matter-of-factly. Well, my friend Christian lives a few houses down from them, and her sister Tasha said that the police found pieces of what looked like hay in and around the bodies, Ryan chimed in. So they were killed by horses? Trevor asked with a frown. 
Or cows, Ryan replied. This made Lana giggle. Guys, enough, Daisy snapped. She left the kitchen to gather them for dinner. Jack hadn't moved an inch the entire time he'd been listening to his kid's conversation. He had seen bits of hay recently himself, hadn't he? Hay and straw. Small piles of it leading off out of their yard when the scarecrow was taken. Could their disappearing prop and the two grisly murders be connected somehow? Was the person committing these heinous crimes also sneaking into their yard each night? It had to be coincidence. Still, his blood ran cold at the thought. That night, after the security system was armed and Daisy and the kids were fast asleep, Jack set up on the front porch with a flashlight in one hand and his metal baseball bat in the other, bundled up against the chilly October air. He made sure to sit back in the shadows where he wouldn't be noticed and kept his flashlight switched off. This time, he was going to see who or what was moving the scarecrow, and he was going to call the police. He just had to catch them in the act to prove he wasn't going crazy. Hours passed in stillness and silence. It was getting even colder, and Jack grabbed the blanket he had brought outside with him, wrapping it around his shoulders. Nothing in the yard was stirring. The props were all as they had left them, casting haunting silhouettes on the grass in the moonlight. From where he sat, he could make out most of the scarecrow's hat poking up in the center of the display, and a few tufts of its frizzy black wig. He kept his eyes trained on it, the minutes ticking away. Jack! The blood-curdling scream split the night and snapped Jack out of his slumber. He had dozed off in the chair. At first, he thought he had dreamt his wife's cry for help, but then it came again. From inside the house, Jack fumbled to turn on his flashlight and pointed it at the scarecrow with shaking hands. It was gone. He leapt up and off the porch, triggering the alarm with an ear-splitting peal that drowned out Daisy's screams. He sprinted closer to the display, shining his light up and over into the center of it. But now he was certain. The scarecrow was definitely missing, and piles of straw led away from its post, away to the left, past where he stood. Past him, across the porch, and through their open front door. The screams mixed with the deafening siren of the alarm caused total chaos as Jack flew through the door and up the stairs, his feet barely touching the floor. Following Daisy's voice, he pounded down the hallway and toward their bedrooms. He tried to hold his hands to his ears and block out the alarm, but they still had a death grip on the baseball bat and flashlight. He wasn't sure, but he thought her cries were coming from Trevor's room. He arrived at the open door just after Daisy's strangled yells were silenced and were quickly replaced by his own. There, crouched over Trevor's pale and mangled body, was the Scarecrow. Daisy was slumped over on the floor behind it, a kitchen knife still in her limp hand, as if she had tried and failed to defend her son. The Scarecrow ever so slowly paused and turned to look at Jack was still standing in the doorway, with his mouth agape and his whole body shaking. Its head was illuminated by the beam of Jack's flashlight. The straw hat and black hair were all too familiar. But now, instead of burlap and string, it was wearing Trevor's distorted and bloodied face. His skin. It smiled far too wide, and with Trevor's mouth it said, Trick-or-treat. By the time the girl was done telling me this tale in magnificent detail, the sun was starting to dip toward the horizon, and the garage sale was closing up shop for the night. I grinned at her and thanked her for the entertainment. I guess it's true what they say about small towns being full of colorful characters. I promptly bought the scarecrow from the lady who was selling it. Who could resist with a crazy story like that? Totally perfect for the season. It's in the garage at the moment, but I'm going to set it up next to our porch tomorrow night, alongside our freshly picked pumpkins. I really feel like it'll pull the whole Halloween vibe together.
I waited patiently by the riverbanks while Charlie went to relieve himself. The rain poured hard towards the poisoned earth, ripping away any life that dared settle in the toxic ground. The waters were murky, the river flowed relentlessly. They had once been so full of life, surrounded by families enjoying their picnics. Now, nothing more than a watery grave destroyed by the ever-present acid rain. It was odd, though, that despite the storm, it hadn't grown in size. It had remained the same monotonous body of water, only disturbed by the occasional piece of driftwood floating downstream. Charlie! Hurry up! It's getting dark! I yelled to my son as he tried to relieve himself behind a barren tree. I'm trying! He shouted back. I couldn't blame him. Taking a piss was harder than one would have thought while soaking wet and freezing cold. He turned silent. I decided to give him some space while I rested up by the riverbank. My body had grown frail in the past year. After supplies diminished, both food and water had become a scarce, invaluable resource. I thought it ironic that we would most likely die from dehydration all the while soaked wet from the sulfuric piss falling down from above. My train of thought was disturbed by what seemed like an oddly shaped tree stump approaching from upriver. I fixed my attention to it as it drifted closer, and realized it wasn't a piece of wood, but a corpse. Fuck it, not again, I mumbled to myself. It had been flayed from top to bottom, not an inch of skin remaining on its bloody surface. Behind it followed another dozen dead bodies, all floating peacefully on top of the water, in various stages of mutilation. All were skinned, but some had additional avulsions, missing arms, legs, even heads that had been violently torn from some of their bodies. At that point, their identities were nothing more than a distant memory, an unimportant detail. They all seemed the same underneath their skin, and now they just added to the pile of corpses in the hellscape of a city we called home. Those people were the brave ones, the ones that tried to leave, but they had known the risk. They knew about the Guardians, yet they ventured across the border, and now they were just pieces of meat flowing with the river. The way their bodies bobbed up and down in the water reminded me, in the most morbid of ways, of times long since past, of the days before the rain. Taking Charlie to the beach with his mother, teaching him how to swim. I almost let myself smile despite the horrific sight, but I was quickly jolted back to reality as one of the corpses landed on the riverbank, fully clothed and seeming unharmed. Charlie, get over here! I called as I ran for the corpse. It was a man in his early twenties, thick, long hair and well fed. Wherever the river had taken him from, he definitely didn't belong in the city. I checked his pulse, barely finding a weak one, and though unconscious, he was definitely alive. Dad, what are you doing? Charlie asked. We've got a live one. Hand me the blanket. Charlie pulled out a soaking wet piece of cloth, hardly protected from the weather by the bag, but it was all we had. I wrapped the man in as well as I could and lifted him up over my shoulder. Dad, what if he's like the others? Charlie asked nervously. He can't be. He looks too healthy. Help me carry my things while I carry him. We have to get him back to shelter, fast. We rushed back towards the ruin we'd called home for the past day. It only took an hour to walk through the storm, but in my fragile state, carrying someone as heavy as that man put me on the brink of collapse. Once we finally reached the house, I dropped the man on the driest part of the floor I could find, and started a futile attempt at making a fire, while Charlie unpacked our things. Dad, I'm going to look for food, Charlie stated, oddly confident. He'd become a resourceful kid, but I had little hope we'd find any treasure. Whoever lived there before had to have emptied the place during the second evacuation. Don't bother, we've already looked through this place. 
As a stubborn kid, he reminded me of his mother, always adamant about finding solutions where there were none. Against my advice, he set off to search the house once more. After a good half an hour, I managed to get a few sparks to ignite a fire. Charlie returned just in time, holding a few cans of beans and a couple of bottles of water. Where did you find these? I asked, equally impressed and surprised. Found them under some planks in the closet, he said, smiling. People had gotten clever during the storm. As food supplies grew short and we lost contact with the outside world, people got serious about hiding their most valuable belongings. And a world where nothing ever grew, where food couldn't be made, gold and money had lost their purpose. You did good, Charlie. I'm proud of you. The man grunted, starting to wake up. What happened? He asked weakly. I knelt down beside him, trying my best to keep him calm. Don't worry, you're safe, I said. What's your name? Peter. Great. Peter, my name is John. Do you know where you are? No. I was just out walking, he groaned. Oh, my head. It really hurts. I noticed a gash on the back of his head, covered by his hair. It had stopped bleeding, but it was a nasty cut in risk of getting infected. Was I in an accident? Why am I not in a hospital? He asked. Hospital? I asked back, confused. Before he could continue, he passed back out. I tried to get him to drink some water, most of which he coughed up. Keeping him warm and hydrated was all I could do while he recovered. Asking for a hospital? He must have been pretty out of it, I mumbled to myself. I turned back to Charlie. He was enjoying his expired can of beans, our first meal in two days. Hardly a feast, but that didn't matter. We need to get some sleep soon, Charlie. We've got a long trek ahead of us tomorrow. Wait, tell me a story first, he demanded. It was a story I'd told a thousand times in the past few years, one of the times before the storm. A story about a world Charlie was far too young to remember, but he'd seen a minuscule part of it and I wanted to keep that glimpse alive, if only as a distant dream. You want to hear about the sun? I asked. He nodded happily. All right, come sit with me. Let's try and get dry before we pass out for the night. We huddled up under the blanket, almost dry from the fire, and for the thousand and first time, I told him about the past. You know the sky is blue? Beyond the darkness and thick clouds we see outside, there's a whole world without rain, without thunder and lightning. And in the center of it all, we have the sun. It's a bright yellow ball hanging up there, watching over us, keeping us warm. Even now, it's giving us life, but it's not as strong as it used to be. It's hidden, like an invaluable treasure. Many years ago, we lived in the sun with your mother. We were so happy. I paused for a moment. Talking about my wife was a hard task, considering how we lost her. Charlie didn't remember, of course, but it stung deep inside my chest, like a cold hand wrapping around my aching heart. I sighed before I continued. She loved taking us to the beach. Endless oceans and soft sand beneath our feet. It was so warm and so bright that we had to eat ice cream just to cool down. Sometimes we even wanted to get wet. We dove into the water, but they weren't dark and grimy. They were crystal clear, blue like the color of your eyes. But it's gone now, isn't it? I'm sure it's out there somewhere. And I promise you, as soon as we can find a way past the Guardians, I'll take you there. You'll see the sun again, Charlie. I promise. I talked more about his mother until he fell asleep. As much as it pained me, I felt it important that he knew what a wonderful woman she was. As night fell over us, the storm worsened, turning from heavy rain to a murderous blizzard. As usual, I found it hard to sleep always worrying the house might collapse as so many buildings had. 
but Charlie slept blissfully, too young to comprehend the true dangers of the world. Dad? Dad? The man is waking up! I awoke to Charlie shaking me. Though I was usually a light sleeper, I somehow barely came to, even as Charlie yelled. Peter was coughing, begging for water. After spending the whole night unconscious, he was finally coming back to it. Water, water, please, he said. I helped him sit up to drink. How are you feeling? Oh man, I'm still here? I thought it was all a dream, he said as he looked around the room. Are we in a abandoned house or something? Well, Peter, it's not abandoned anymore, I joked, stupidly trying to brighten the mood. Shouldn't I be in a hospital? He asked again. I was confused, but he'd suffered a fairly traumatic head injury, so I let the question slide while I started breakfast. I cooked up some beans and offered them to Peter. Without supplies, I couldn't do much for his wound, only observe and hope a fever didn't fester. Do you know where we are? I asked, trying to get an idea of his state of mind. I don't know. I don't remember anything other than walking around. I was heading for a picnic, I think. Then there was a, a bright flash, and next thing I know, I wake up here. A picnic? Yeah, it's been the warmest summer in years, they say. I wanted to enjoy the weather, but by the look of the rain outside, I guess that didn't last very long. Warm summer? Picnics? It had become clear how confused he really was. We're in Greenville, I said. Greenville? I've never heard of that name. I come from Portland. Portland wasn't anywhere nearby. Closest town over would have been Clint, but God knows what still existed beyond the boundaries of our hellhole. You have sun in Portland? Yeah, blazing, burning sun every day for the past month. For a moment, I considered the fact that the world had kept going long after our city's demise. That despite our hardship, there existed a better place where life thrived. <sighs> Yet I knew leaving would be impossible. You're telling me the world is still going? That outside of this shit, people are just living normal lives? Of course. We never even heard about a storm destroying a city. No one knows about Greenville. This is all a bit bizarre. I stood up and paced around the room. A thousand thoughts and ideas flowing through my mind. The world hadn't ended. It was only us, only our city, closed off from the rest of the world and left to suffer. People couldn't leave, but then again, none had entered it either. Since the fall of our city and collapse of the colony, Peter was the first seemingly healthy human we'd stumbled across. If he could get in, then maybe, just maybe, we could get out. Dad, there's a woman outside, Charlie yelled from one of the windows, breaking me away from my brainstorm. Stay back, Charlie, I demanded as I rushed outside, Peter getting up and following suit. The rain poured as always, filling up a smaller sinkhole down the end of the street. Most houses had long since collapsed, and those that still stood were slowly being etched away by the acid. A woman stood in the middle of the street, her back facing towards us. She wore nothing more than a light dress, hardly providing protection from the horrific weather. She'd been hurt, leaving an exposed wound on her left shoulder, no longer bleeding but oozing with thick yellow pus. What the hell is she doing just standing there? Peter asked. Don't get close. Let me deal with it, I responded. I walked up behind the woman. The veins on her arm were protruding out, marking an infection that was growing up towards her neck. She was on the brink of sepsis and would soon perish. Without hesitating, I pulled her head back by her hair. As I did, I also lifted up my hunting knife and slit her throat. I'm sorry. 
I whispered as blood poured down her newly created orifice. She didn't even react as she quickly bled out. Seconds later, she had died. Holy shit! What the fuck did you just do? Peter yelled from the house. He stood frozen in fear, staring at my bloody hands. He didn't understand what I had just done. It then dawned on me that Peter truly came from a better place, one without the daily horrors we faced. I set her free, I responded, already out of breath. Peter turned to run, but I gave chase. Despite my malnourished body and wasted frame, I was far faster in the rain and quickly pinned him down. Let me go! You're crazy! He yelled. Peter, calm down. I can explain this. Explain what? You just straight up murdered someone! He continued. I let him go, causing him to slip onto the muddy, wet ground. I kept my knife pointed at him, forcing him to stick around a little longer. You really don't know what's going on here, do you? I asked. Please, don't kill me. Just tell me what the fuck you want. Of course I won't kill you. You're not empty. Not like them. Not yet. I flipped my knife around, gesturing for Peter to take it. Now that I'm unarmed, you're going to listen. He took the knife, clutching onto it with shaking hands. It put me in harm's way, but I felt safe nonetheless. Peter wasn't from around Greenville. He'd been sheltered, safe from the nightmare that had been our lives for the past years, meaning that he still didn't have murder in his heart. Why did you kill her? He asked with a shaky voice. Because she was already dead. The parts of her that matters anyway. You notice the wound on her arm? Her clear apathy towards it? It's because she's one of them. One of the empty people. What do you mean, empty people? I walked back over to the corpse of the thing I'd just killed turning her over to see her face. Full of scratches, even an eye missing, probably from walking into walls and debris lying around. It's the rain, I said calmly while presenting the wounds of someone who'd clearly given up on their own well-being. It changes people, hollows them out, taking away their memories, stripping them of all emotion. That's the fate of most people living in this city, and whatever they once were, Accountants, mechanics, doctors, they ain't anymore. All they do now is walk around, get hurt, and die. Then why kill them? Because they're already gone. Only their bodies stay behind to suffer. The least we can do for them is free them. Besides, they get riled up if disturbed. Sometimes they get violent. He'd lowered his guard by then either from believing my story or because he simply didn't have much of a choice. Peter was trapped alongside us in the storm, unable to survive without my help, but unbeknownst to him, he could be our ticket out of there. How long have you been here? was all he asked. Seven years. Peter collapsed to the ground in disbelief, fearing he'd suffer the same fate. I walked over and put a comforting hand on his shoulder, mustering as much confidence as I could into the next few words. But now, we're all getting out of here. Together. My plan was simple enough in theory. Follow the river and retrace its path back towards where it grabbed Peter. It might have given us a safe way past the Guardians lurking in the Dark Territory. While we got ready for the day's trek, I felt hopeful. For the first time in about six years, I truly believed we stood a chance. During the early days of the storm, we'd all been a part of a mass evacuation. As the first buildings fell to the sinkholes created by the downpour, people started to panic. The evacuation itself was a shit show. Thousands of cars immediately congested on the highway. As a last resort, we attempted to flee on foot with the pitch black clouds looming above us striking down with lightning ever so often, seeming to appear from the ground itself. My family and I were quite far in the back, and when reaching the border out of the city, we halted in our steps. Before us, 
lay thousands of skinless bodies. Entire families embraced in death with horrified expressions on their flayed faces. In the blink of an eye, well over a hundred thousand people had been slaughtered, repurposed for a meat wall spanning around the entire city, keeping us trapped. The mere fact that Peter got inside ignited a fresh wave of hope throughout my body. It meant that there had to be a weak spot in the Dark Territory, one where we could escape through. Charlie presented us with a few bottles of water he'd found while searching the neighboring houses. It wasn't much to keep us going, but I'd found a new source of motivation. So, we're leaving the city? Peter asked. That's right. If a better place exists, I have to get my son there. Mind me asking why you haven't left already? I mean, this place isn't all that great. Because it's dangerous, Peter. People have tried and died. What makes you so sure we'll survive then? He asked, looking at me with a mix of fear and confusion. Because now we know it's possible. You got in. That means we can get out. A few more bodies had landed on the riverbank where we found Peter the day before. Unlike him, they were beyond saving. Flayed and mutilated like all the others. Peter looked at them in disbelief and disgust unable to believe the horrors that lay before him. Wh what happened to them? He asked. Those are the people that tried to leave, I said. And, and that's where we're heading? He continued, panicked. Listen to me, Peter. There's no food, no water, nothing left in the city for us. We either take our chances here, or we die from thirst and starvation in the city. Remember that you made it in here, and that I promise you a better chance if we keep going. We followed the river upstream, half a day's trek just to get to the bridge. The rest would be spent crossing it. The bridge was the name given to a collection of sinkholes spanning around the city, 96 miles wide and two miles across, a place of destruction and almost impossible to pass. A section of the sinkholes had been covered in various debris, cars and corpses giving it the unfitting name, filling it to the brim to the point we could cross. Hence, a bridge. Despite its dangerous content, it would be our safest route to the other side. Of course, the empty people lurked around the bridge as well, but they were different. Those that existed here still had the basic instinct of escaping making them far more terrifying than anything found within the city limits. I let my mind wander as we walked slowly by the river. The monotonous flow of water against the harsh tickle of rain was somehow soothing. It brought back memories of the second evacuation and the first empty people. I saw an image of myself holding on to my three-year-old son with one arm and my wife with the other. We were crushed in the middle of a panicked crowd when my wife, Loretta, suddenly let go. I tried so desperately to grab hold of her again, but she simply stood there, letting the crowd trample her down as we were pulled away. She was left behind, one of the first people to forget themselves, to hollow out and become one of the empty people. Most people could feel it coming on. They knew that they were about to turn but not her. For whatever reason, it happened within seconds. Following the failed second evacuation, we searched for weeks. Hundreds of colonists looking for their loved ones, but to no avail. Loretta was more than likely one of the empties that had wandered into harm's way, dying from their own neglect. Dad? Dad? What are you doing? Charlie asked as I snapped back to reality. I had stopped moving, lost in my own thoughts, unable to react with the outside world. Dad? John? Peter chimed in. Finally, I managed to get myself going. I'm sorry. I just needed to catch my breath. I lied. Let's keep moving. Another hour and we finally reached the bridge. Before us, we saw dozens of endless collections of sinkholes, partially filled with solid debris. 
dozens of bodies littering the pits among a few surviving stragglers. This isn't exactly what I had in mind when you said we had to cross a bridge, Peter said. The river ran straight through the sinkholes, dragging part of its foundation with it. We had to keep a certain distance away from the river, lest we get dragged away with everything else. This is more like a hole, if I'm entirely honest, he continued. I kneeled down beside my son. This would be his first time crossing the bridge without my help. On each prior cross, he'd been too young, and I carried him on my back or had him wait back at the colony. Now that the colony was gone, and I was too weak to carry him, he'd have to manage on his own. You ready to do this, Charlie? I asked. He nodded, as brave as he'd ever been. Listen, there's bound to be a bunch of empty people stuck in the debris. It's going to be dangerous. These empties are different from the ones we've seen in the city. They'll call out for help, they'll beg and bargain, but don't let that fool you. There's no fear, sadness, nor anger in their voices. There'll be no urgency even as they lay there bleeding out. So whatever happens, do not approach them, I said, looking back and forth between Peter and Charlie. They both nodded, confused but diligent. We tied a rope between the three of us, walking ten feet apart would ensure that if one of us fell into a pit or sank into the unstable ground, the other two could pull them back up. Charlie, being the lightest, walked at the back of our small group, while I led the charge. It only took a couple of hundred feet before we saw one of the empty people trapped inside a crushed car. Emaciated and pale, probably stuck there for the past year, waiting for someone to pass. It pleaded and begged for us to help, asking in the most apathetic voice possible, completely rid of any emotion. Don't go to the other side without me. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. It said. Another one we passed had just impaled itself on a piece of debris, bleeding profusely. Within an hour it would be dead, yet it kept talking to us as if nothing had happened. Its words making sense, but all emotion behind them, non-existent. Hey, take me with you. Please, please, please. It doesn't hurt, I promise. It doesn't hurt. I'll be okay. I'll be okay. Peter looked with concern at the trapped creatures, worried and sorry about its pitiful state. Let it be, I ordered. We can't help them. He complied and we kept walking. John, how about you tell me how all this happened? Peter asked. I shrugged off his curiosity. It wasn't a memory I wanted to dig into. We're better off focusing on the rough terrain. We ain't got time to talk, I shot back. All right, how about a short summary then? I sighed, already out of breath from the rough trek across the bridge, ignoring him initially, but he kept crying. He wasn't going to let it go. They said the storm would pass in the week, I finally uttered after about the tenth time he asked. We did as we were told, holding up inside our homes, stocking up on food and water as the worst passed. Only it never did, and after a month of the acidic rain etching away at our once friendly city, buildings started collapsing, sinkholes swallowed up the roads, and people died. I sat down on a rock, trying to catch my breath. Talking while wandering was a painful task. Then the people started acting strange. We'd find men, women, and children just wandering through the streets at night, wearing nothing more than their nightgowns to protect them from the pouring rain. They had this look in their eyes, as if they weren't aware enough to care about their surroundings. Sometimes they'd even get hurt break a leg or rupture an artery, yet they just kept walking aimlessly around, ignoring our pleas to just come back inside. Peter stepped out in front of me. That's what happened to your colony? he asked. Our colony was formed after the first six months. We gathered as many resources as we could, non-perishable foods and water. Since only a thousand people survived the first two evacuations, 
We'd figured we'd be fine for a few years at least, but the rain kept pouring. We'd lost contact with the outside world, and anyone brave enough to venture into the dark zone ended up dead. We were trapped, scared, and running out of supplies faster than anticipated. You want to know what happens when there's no system to keep people in place? Peter shook his head. I got back up to my feet and we kept moving. Well, let's say the empty people weren't the only ones losing their sense of self. A small group of empty people started getting close. They'd miraculously navigated across the bridge without getting impaled or hurt by the various debris. They kept mumbling nonsense as they walked past. The only word I could make out was salvation. Let him be, I demanded. Peter kept inquiring about our situation. So you've been stuck here for the past seven years, he asked. That's right, seven years since the storm began in 2020. Peter stopped dead in his tracks, halting our progress. What the hell do you mean, 2020? The year? What else? I asked, confused. You're saying the storm started seven years ago in 2020, making the current year 2027? By my estimation, yeah. It's been a bit hard to keep track, but I'm pretty sure we're either in July or August. Why do you ask? John, it's only 2019. I chuckled at the absurd statement. <laughs> Listen, Peter, you hit your head pretty hard. It's understandable that you're confused. Look at me, John. I was born in 1995. Do I look like I'm mid-30s? He asked. He didn't. He looked like someone in their early 20s, just like I thought when I first found him. Yet it made no sense. If it truly was that long ago for him, then it meant he'd traveled not only from outside, but from the past. You really think you've traveled through time? I asked, sounding more condescending than intended. Well, is that any less likely than a storm lasting seven years? People turning empty and mysterious guardians hindering any escape? He asked back. Despite my disbelief in his statement, he had a point. But that means... I stopped. Means what, John? It means the world is truly gone. Then how did I get here? He said, getting more agitated by the minute. I... I don't know. But the plan stays the same. We keep moving across the bridge. Towards what? Certain death? To be flayed by the Guardians like that pile of bodies back at the river? I don't know! I shouted back, loud enough to attract the attention of the passing empty people, most stuck in debris by then. Peter got quiet. But do you have a better plan? There's no food left, no water, nothing. You want to go back? We'll die before we find shelter again. So my plan remains. We're following the river, and while we do, we desperately pray to any god you can think of that we somehow manage to find out how the hell you ended up here. He just stared at me. Seven years, Peter. My son grew up not knowing the warmth of the sun, and I'll die before he gets stuck here for the rest of his life. While I frantically yelled in anger, one of the empty people got close enough to grab Charlie. I had lost focus and just stared at him in complete apathy. For a moment, it didn't matter what happened next. Help me. Help me. Help me. Let's stick together. 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 It begged as it pulled him towards a pit. I just stared. Dad! Help me! Charlie cried, but I stared on, unable to make myself move. John, what the hell are you doing? Peter shouted as he ran over to help Charlie. Finally, I snapped back to reality, immediately pulling my knife out, pushing the creature away from my son while impaling it through an eye. As it fell over dead, Charlie cried out for the first time in years, and Peter turned to me with an angry expression on his face. John! Why did you just stand there? He shouted. I... I don't know. I rushed over to console Charlie, but he pushed me away. I just lost myself from, for a moment. I, I, 
I can't explain it. We didn't have time to discuss it. The darkness loomed over us as nightfall approached. After catching our breath once more, we rushed the last few hundred feet across. We desperately needed to find shelter before another blizzard set in. No sooner had we set foot on the edge of the bridge before a brilliantly bright light appeared on the horizon. It was unlike anything I'd seen since the beginning of the storm, appearing as a blue sun lighting up everything around us. The light looked cold as ice, yet it warmed us more than anything had for the past seven years. The river stretched all the way towards the light, and I knew in my heart that Peter had somehow come through that. Is that the sun? Charlie asked hopefully. No, that's something else entirely, I responded, baffled by the magnificent sight. How far away is it? Peter asked. I tried to the best of my ability to judge the distance, but the shine of the light made it hard to get a clear view. If it lay just by one of the bodies of water making up the river, it would be another day's trek, meaning we'd have to venture through the dark territory. I'm guessing another day and a half's walk, I said, finally. They both seemed hopeful. The terrain itself wasn't as rough as the rest of the trip, but I was beginning to realize I might not make it that far. In any case, we still need to find shelter. We're not traversing the dark territory at night. We searched for an hour before finally finding a partially collapsed warehouse. Not a great cover for the oncoming blizzard, but it was the best that we could do in the outskirts of town. I lit a fire for the night and shared the last can of beans. I'm sorry about earlier, I said to Charlie. It's okay, Charlie said, half asleep. Can you tell me a story? That night, as Charlie fell asleep, for the first time, I told him about a story of the future, not the past. I love you. Be good, kid. I remained awake, staring into the embers as the blizzard raged outside. My mind wandered. I tried to keep it focused, but to no avail. I saw images of my wife, memories of digging sand castles on a beach with Charlie flashes of wine and dances, the past of a better life. I was tired, worn down to the bone, hollowed out by the rain like so many people before me. In a matter of hours, my mind would be lost and my son would be left alone, fending for himself with someone who clearly didn't belong. Without waking the other two, I sat down to write the final part of my journal. I've kept track of most events during the past seven years, but I feel like the last few days are the most important. I'm leaving this to you, Peter. When you find me empty in the morning, I need you to take Charlie with you across the dark territory. Bring him to the light and cross over to a better world. You might even have a chance to stop this all from happening. Charlie. I love you. Be good and live a happier life in the sun. I wish I could be there with you up until the end, but my time is up. You deserve so much more than this world has given you. And now you might finally have it. Good luck to you both. John When the morning rolled around, John had left either to keep us safe or because he'd hollowed out and gone to face the rain one last time. He pulled me out of the river, he saved my life, and in return, I promised to keep Charlie safe. He left behind his journal, which is what you've all just read, and while there's a lot more to Charlie and my story, I felt this should be what I post first. John deserved that much. I awoke in the early hours of the following morning. Charlie was frantically calling out for his father. John had left his bed and seemingly vanished, leaving his journal placed neatly beside my bed. We searched the warehouse before I even checked what John had written, but he wasn't inside. I picked up the journal and opened it. I only needed to read the first few lines to realize what had happened. John had turned empty and left instructions to me. 
telling me to save Charlie. Dad! Charlie yelled out as he stormed out the door, back into the rain. John was standing motionless outside, staring towards the horizon. He didn't even react to Charlie's plea for attention. Dad! What are you doing? He continued, on the verge of tears. He walked towards John, though whatever John had been just a day before had been washed away by the heavy rainfall. Charlie, stay away from John! I yelled as I ran over to grab him. Let me go! He said as he tried to wriggle himself loose from my grip. Dad! He cried. John hadn't moved, not even acknowledging our presence. No! 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 He kept screaming as I pulled him back inside the warehouse and shut the door. He was incredibly strong for a ten-year-old, but I kept him at bay while he cried and punched me. He's gone, Charlie. John is gone. No, he isn't. He can't be. He promised. He continued, sobbing incomprehensibly. I held him tight and let him cry it out, and he eventually stopped resisting my grip. The one person in his life had been taken away for no reason other than bad luck. Simply wasted away in a world where humanity became little more than a faint memory. Charlie sat beside the fire, reading John's journal. He silently sobbed as he turned the pages. He'd learned to read from his father, and he'd written the journal as a reminder of what they had gone through, in hopes that one day someone would save them. I'm sorry about your dad, Charlie. He didn't respond. I packed what little things we had into John's bag. We had to keep walking while we still had the energy. Without food nor water, this would be our last day, whether we found salvation or not. When we finally got back outside, John had wandered off. I had the thought of killing what remained of him in the back of my head, to free him like he'd taught me. But now, I wouldn't get that chance. Thanks for saving me, John. You were a good man. I mumbled to myself. The light shined bright in the horizon, reflecting off the millions of raindrops, appearing in endless beams shooting through the air. Despite the cold blue color, it made me feel warm to once again wander through light, to once again see the landscape in front of me. Do you want to talk about it? I asked Charlie. He looked at me for a brief moment and shook his head. The river got wider as we proceeded. In the distance, something that looked like a wall appeared, spanning endlessly in each direction around the city. What's that wall? I asked. It's the flesh. That's where the dark territory begins, he responded quietly. Faint clicking sounds could be heard in the distance, distorted echoes coming from whatever lurked in the rain. A few empty people wandered alongside us on our journey, too many to kill, and they seemed oblivious to our company. They had come from all directions, but each were pulled towards the light. On the road, several emaciated figures lay motionless. They had become too weak to move. Only their blinking eyes proved that they were still alive. When we got close enough to see the wall, I could make out figures. Limbs, viscera, and torn flesh made out the majority of the wall. Charlie barely acknowledged the horror before us, unafraid and apathetic to it. If he was just a brave kid or on the brink of turning empty, I couldn't tell. Some empties were trying to climb the wall but its slippery surface caused them to slip and sink into the meat-filled mass. The only opening was by the river. Piles of dead people littered the water, but the wall wasn't as thick around it. We could pass easily enough. As we walked around the riverside, the clicking got louder. It was rhythmic and split up into intervals. Though I couldn't exactly determine its origin, it came from several directions. As if something was communicating. On the other side of the wall, we were faced with a new type of nightmare. The entire land had turned into an impossible fleshscape, with what appeared as muscles, tendons, and blood vessels covering every inch of its surface. 
a single empty person made it above the wall and wandered across the flesh. Tendrils entangled in vessels reached out from the ground and grabbed onto the empty, bringing them down to the ground, slowly consuming and merging them with itself. How are we going to get through there? I asked. Charlie didn't respond. He simply climbed down from the wall, wielding his knife. A few tendrils grew from the ground, wrapped in veins, but Charlie slashed at them with his knife, causing blood to spurt out briefly before they fell to the ground. Charlie, what are you doing? They can't get us if we keep moving, he said. You've been here before? I asked. One time. I climbed down onto the flesh-covered surface. It felt warm to the touch, gently bouncing my feet with each step. A tendril reached for me, and I slashed it off with ease. It was slow for sure, and as long as we kept wandering, we'd seemingly be safe. The light was still a few hours away, but it had grown to a tremendous size, a brilliant blue globe lighting our path to salvation. We kept close to the river. If John had been right, we simply needed to follow it all the way to the light. Every now and then, a body, limb, or viscera was pulled from the fleshscape and floated downstream towards the city. The clicking was getting closer, but I was starting to realize that it didn't come from any direction in the distance. It was coming from underground. That's the first time I noticed how the ground twitched and contracted in response to our steps. It hadn't occurred to me in the early stages of the Dark Territory, but now it was impossible to ignore. Charlie, hold up! What? We both stopped walking, but the twitching continued going from minor ticks to violent spastic contractions. Some muscle fibers in the ground opened up beneath our feet. We pulled away towards the river. Watch out! I yelled. What is happening? He answered back. A tall figure dug itself up from the ground, towering fifteen feet tall, two legs and a torso, but without arms nor a head. Its skin seemed charred black, vesticles covering the majority of its surface. It emitted the clicking sound we'd heard, calling out for the tendrils which emerged from the ground in response. It held onto the ground with its legs, claws sticking out from all sides of the stumpy appendage. Run! I ordered. I grabbed Charlie and we headed straight for the river. It was the only place I could think to hide and since the flesh didn't grow much into the water, I hoped it couldn't sense us there. The creature wandered across the meat-covered land, turning its charred torso around while searching for whatever had awoken it, looking for us. Beneath the pitch-black skin of the creature, a couple of lids tore apart, revealing a single, completely white eye with a minuscule pupil darting rapidly around in its socket. We lowered ourselves into the water, hoping the creature wouldn't notice us. As long as we didn't touch the flesh, it couldn't sense us. What the hell is that thing? I whispered. It's a guardian. The commotion had attracted a couple of empty people, both relatively unharmed even on the fleshscape. The ground twitched beneath their feet as they approached the creature. It observed them for a brief moment before grabbing one of them with a foot, and in a single swift movement, it tore the empty person in half. Its leg then started expanding, and its flesh wrapped around the half it still held onto. Within a second, the skin had been seared off by the acid seeping out of one of the bursting vesticles on the creature's skin, after which it dumped the flayed person onto the ground, letting the flesh fuse together. After less than a minute, both bodies had been flayed and consumed, and the creature seemed content. But the original disturbance caused by us still lingered on its mind. It kept searching while we hid in the river. We must have hung onto the edge of the river for an hour while the creature searched. All the while, its eye remained open, unblinking, desperately searching for intruders. After a while, the clicking stopped, and the tendrils sunk back into the ground. After the last tendril disappeared, 
the Guardian closed its eye and simply started sinking back into the ground, leaving the surface monotonous and empty once more. Relieved, I let out a sigh. The river, despite its strong current, would be our safest option proceeding ahead. All right, we better keep moving. We can't walk on land anymore. Those things can sense our touch. Charlie nodded, shivering from the freezing water. But while the fleshscape stretched endlessly far, impossible to traverse, the light itself was close, within reach. If we kept moving, we'd be there in an hour. I dug out the rope from our backpack and tied it between myself and Charlie. The water wasn't particularly deep near the edge, but sudden surges in the current could easily sweep one of us away, especially a small, malnourished kid like Charlie. I'm really cold, he said. We're almost there, Charlie. Can you hang on for just a bit longer? I I'll try. We walked in the knee-deep freezing water, trying our best to avoid small flesh appendages that had grown into the side of the river. Any touch would alert the guardians, and if they saw us, we wouldn't stand a chance. Just a bit further. We're almost there, I said. Charlie started slowing down. As skinny as he was on the brink of starvation, he simply couldn't retain much heat. I'm tired, he said. Don't give up, Charlie, I begged. I felt him tug on the rope behind me. He had almost come to a complete standstill. Without any other option, I lifted him up and put him on my back. We were so close, the light shined brighter than ever before, and it warmed me up to the point where I barely felt the freezing temperature of the water anymore. Why didn't it work for Charlie? Charlie, we're almost there. He didn't respond. He'd fallen unconscious from the cold and exhaustion. Charlie! I upped my pace, but the current had gotten stronger and the end of the river finally met us. What lay before us was a massive lake, covered by a thin layer of what seemed like human skin, stretched so thin it had become partially transparent. The blue light hung a few feet in the air on the other side of the lake, appearing as a massive globe of ice. Charlie, do you see that? We're almost home. He didn't respond. We had to tread back onto land to get around the lake. If not, we'd end up enveloped in the mesh of skin that was covering the waters. Only a few hundred yards to safety. I stepped onto the riverbank, and the ground immediately twitched in reaction. I took another step, causing a tendril to emerge from the ground and reach for me. It was much thicker than the ones we'd faced before, and I only had one hand free while trying to keep Charlie on my back. I swung with all my force and cut through it. The ground shook as the muscles moved apart, leaving a large gash in the ground from where the guardians could emerge. Three pulled themselves up through the flesh and gave chase after us. They were tall, much larger than before, but to our advantage, they were also slower. Even with Charlie on my back, I could outrun them, but not for long. Several tendrils extended from the ground, not trying to grab myself, but going directly for Charlie. A few clung on, and I swung at them, severing a few. On my second swing, one grabbed the shaft of my knife, cutting it into itself, but causing me to let go of it. Hang on, Charlie! I yelled as I ran, my legs almost bursting from the effort. The guardians seemed bizarrely slow, quickly giving up on the chase as we got closer to the light. I peeked back at them, and they seemed almost frozen, as if covered in ice emerging from the blue light. Despite the guardians struggling, the tendrils kept growing in number and size, grasping for us as we spurted over the fleshscape. Charlie started coming too as we got closer to the glowing globe. He moaned quietly in agony. The light! It hurts! He called out as we got closer. It was horribly bright, almost blinding, yet nothing could compare to the beauty, its magnificent contrast to its horrible surroundings. Whatever pain it caused Charlie, it was better than staying behind to be flayed by the monsters. One of the tendrils caught my leg, causing me to stumble to the ground and dropping Charlie. Another grabbed him where he lay on the ground. I kicked and tore at its flesh, 
Finally, it let me go, but it had grabbed Charlie around his neck, choking away what little life he had left. Even with all my force, I couldn't tear it away, and as a last resort, I simply bit it. A metallic taste flooded my mouth as blood spurted from the twisted appendage. I spit it out and lift Charlie off the ground. My muscles burned and my joints ached, but I kept moving, dragging my beaten body across the ground. I got a bit further before collapsing. The light hung just a few feet above us, but I couldn't bring myself back to my feet. I reached out my hand, trying to grab the light, and suddenly, I felt the ground give in beneath me. We were lifting up towards it. We made it, Charlie, I said on the brink of passing out. The blue light started enveloping us. All the pain and fear that had filled my body started to vanish. I looked for Charlie. I held on to his hand, but I couldn't see him anymore. Charlie! The last thing I heard was a scream of agony coming from Charlie. He was falling back through the light towards the fleshscape. I frantically tried to grab onto him, but the light was too bright. I couldn't see, I couldn't hear nor feel at all anymore. It was as if the world had been erased and myself with it. Then I fell. Even now, I can't tell how far I fell. It could have been a few feet, it could have been miles. All I remember was hitting the ground hard my body breaking as I landed in a different world. I lay motionless, unable to breathe. As my vision returned, I saw a brilliant blue sky, cloudless, only decorated with our yellow majestic sun. I laughed. I was back. I was safe. After a horrific ordeal, I could finally rest, and with that, I let myself pass out. They found me laying in the middle of a football field, two broken legs, a few ribs and multiple vertebra, bruises, torn ligaments and a punctured lung. I had been beaten up quite badly by the fall, but despite it all, I'd survived. Charlie, we made it, were the first words I spoke as I woke up a couple of days later in the hospital. Who's Charlie? The doctor asked as he checked my vitals. The kid. I came... The, the kid I came through the portal with. Where is he? Where's Charlie? The doctor laughed. Your name is Peter Matthews, correct? I nodded my head, pain radiating down my spine. I asked him again about Charlie, mumbling something about the portal and asked if the rain had come yet. I was high on pain medication, so the doctor initially shrugged off my weird questions. Charlie never came with me through the portal. I remembered his screams of agony, letting go of his hand, and it dawned on me that he'd stayed behind, left to suffer in the rain. They'd found me alone. A witness said I simply appeared in the middle of the field. According to my injuries, they believed I'd fallen quite a distance, but from where, they couldn't tell. At the moment of writing this, I'm still cooped up in the hospital. I tried searching for John and Charlie online, but without their last names, it's a futile task. Not to mention that Greenville is an extremely generic town's name. I owe them both my life, and in return, I ended up losing them. So, I'm writing this in their honor. They gave me a second chance at life, returned me to my own life, Though, if the storm truly begins in 2020, we might not have much time left. John, if you read this, believe me when I say this is going to happen. Get out of Greenville. Save your family while there's still time. I grew up in a place called Liar's Fane, or the Fane as locals called it. A solid two and a half hours from anywhere worth going. I lived with my grandmother in her rustic weathered farmhouse, just beyond the edge of the Fane. 
earth set adrift in the countless acres of wheat and corn that occupied the empty space between towns. Nana was well known in the Fane. The townsfolk called her an herbalist, but it was bullshit and they all knew it. Nana had a gift. It was real and palpable. You could sense it just being around her, like the static charge before a lightning strike. People from the area came to see my grandmother for all sorts of reasons. Some were desperate for a family, others had failing health, and a few just needed an understanding ear. Nana listened to their problems, with the patience I'd often benefited from during my teenage years. Then she'd offer sage advice, along with a poultice, tincture, or herbal bundle, delicately wrapped up in a sheer muslin cloth. Her guests left feeling better, lighter, and with careful instructions on how to use the potent mixture they were given. It's all about intention, she told me, slowly grinding her obsidian pestle into its paired mortar filled with willow bark. If you make something with love, good things will come to those it touches. I'd always wondered if the opposite was true. I learned everything I could from her, about plants and their different uses, and about the power of intention. She often told me I was naturally gifted when it came to herbs, though she never let me help her while she worked, always saying it was too dangerous. When I turned 18, I moved to the city to attend university. Nana insisted I leave the Fane and never look back, forbidding me from even coming to visit, saying that the place had a way of holding on to you. We talked over the phone several times a week, then through video calls when I sent her a laptop for Christmas. She cried when she saw me on the computer screen, remarking how grown up I looked. I couldn't believe how she looked exactly the same. A month before her 100th birthday, she called me. But this time, she acted strangely, saying and doing things with an air of finality that frightened me. She told me everything was fine, and I didn't need to worry, but there was something in her voice that told me it was time to come home. She blanched when she saw me on her doorstep, then gathered me into a fierce hug, scolding me for daring to come back. At first, I thought I'd overreacted, mistaking Nana's strange behavior for something more worrisome, but she seemed as lucid and wily as ever. In fact, it felt as though nothing had changed. It was just as I remembered it from my childhood. A steady stream of people coming and going throughout the day. The smell of crushed lavender mingling with cedar. And Nana, shouting for me to hunt down one herb or another from her entropic garden. I sat on the sun-baked porch, where tangled masses of withering vines mounted a decades-long assault on the cracked and battered wood. To my surprise, I had settled back into the strange silence of the country as though I'd only been away a few days, instead of over a decade. Nana's voice carried through the kitchen's open window, calling me inside. You remember Mrs. Linden, don't you? Nana said, motioning to the regal, silver-haired woman seated next to her. The woman stood and grabbed my hand shaking it with restrained enthusiasm. Her piercing eyes, as silvered as her hair, locked on to mine. Oh, it's been such a long time. We are all very excited to see what you're capable of. I smiled politely, then gave Nana a questioning look. What I'm capable of? Well, I should be going now. I'll come back tomorrow to pick up my order. The woman said, ignoring the question. She swept from the room and out the front door, shutting it quietly behind her. What the hell was that about? I said. Nana smiled sadly, then motioned for me to sit. Doris says her husband has something of a violent temper, and it's only getting worse. Oh, I said, as Nana filled two cups with a steaming rosy-colored tea. Shouldn't she tell the sheriff or something? Nana shook her head. She seemed to age as we sat there. No, 
this is something I think you can handle. She said, sliding me her obsidian mortar and pestle. I'd always been forbidden from touching Nana's tools. Resigned to only watching her craft the herbal remedies the people of the Fane so highly regarded. I reached out, touching it as though it were a sacred object. Me? I said, sliding my fingers over the mortar's black, glassy surface. If you were to make something for her, what intention should you have? Protection, I suppose. I said, feeling a sudden knot forming in my stomach. Something was wrong. Why did she suddenly want my help, making a mixture she could make blindfolded? So, now you have your tools and your intention. What comes next? Nana grabbed her gnarled wooden cane and pointed it in the direction of her whitewashed cupboards. I rose from my chair and opened the lowest cupboard doors, revealing an overly large spice rack. I shifted through the countless glass jars, small cloth pouches, and unmarked tins. Uh, agrimony, nettle, and blessed thistle, I said pulling each from the shelf as I found them. Good girl! Nana tapped her cane on the floor in applause. She stood with some effort, edging closer to watch as I placed leaves and stems into the waiting mortar. I hesitated, unsure of what exactly I was supposed to make. Nana held up her index finger, as gnarled and crooked as the cane she leaned on. Never forget, little one. It's your intention that's key. I nodded, and began working the bits of dried herbs into a fine powder, as I'd seen my grandmother do a thousand times before. It went on that way for almost a week, though Nana offered less and less input with each order I filled, content to just sit and watch. The morning of Nana's birthday, I sat at her bedside, a tray of toast and coffee cooling at my feet. Her eyes were open, staring into the empty space above the foot of her bed, while grasping a massive, tattered tome in one rigored hand, and an ornate wooden box in the other. I gently removed each from her grip, placing them on the nightstand, then closed her eyes. She looked so serene lying there, so peaceful. I stood there for a long time, watching her, and realizing I didn't feel all that surprised. Nana did everything with purpose, and during the past week, it felt as though she were preparing to go somewhere. It was like the excited energy on the night before a big trip. Sad to leave, but excited to go. Nana's house was full that night. The people of Lyersfane turned out to pay their respects, but the evening was filled with strange, offhand comments, echoing the words of Mrs. Linden the week before. We're so excited to see what you're capable of. I retreated upstairs, away from the nauseating hum of laughter and small talk into the quiet of Nana's darkened room. I stood, unmoving, staring down at the tray of this morning's untouched breakfast as tears slipped down onto the front of my shirt. I sat on the edge of her bed, letting my head fall into my hands for a few brief, unstoppable sobs. The creaking of mattress springs and rustling of blankets startled me. I sprang to my feet. I could see the mattress bowing, as if under someone's weight. Then came the smell of lavender. I quickly turned on the light, blinking away the teary haze. The room was again silent, and the scent gone. The book, I'd placed on the bedside table that morning, was cracked open to a dog-eared page midway through. I leaned in to examine the handwriting on the brittle yellowed paper. 
The child, bound by birth, must bear the iniquity of the forefather. I felt a chill crawl its way up my spine, standing my hairs on end. I didn't know what it was supposed to mean, but it had a physical effect all the same. The feeling of eyes on me made me turn. Mrs. Linden stood motionless in the doorway. Oh, there you are, she said, reanimating to glide toward me. Grabbing my hand, she pulled me back toward the stairs, where the townspeople had gathered. The laughter and small talk had been replaced by an oppressive silence, as Mrs. Linden stopped us on the second stair from the bottom. We just wanted to say how much we appreciated your grandmother. She was a part of all our lives, but we know she left us in good hands. The crowd raised their assorted glasses in a solemn salute. Thank you, but I'm not staying, I said. The serious expressions of the crowd lessened as the corners of everyone's mouth seemed to curl upward in a unified, knowing smile. Your grandmother was the same way at first, but she came round, and so will you. Mrs. Linden's grip on my arm held me like a vice. I winced in pain and tried to pull away, but every movement I made was met with her hand clamping tighter into my flesh. I stopped struggling and stared at her in disbelief. She let go and smiled. See how easy that is? She said. The crowd murmured their approval, then continued their jovial small talk. I rubbed my arm. It ached and throbbed. I was certain a bruise was already forming. These people were crazy if they thought they could bully me into staying. I don't know what kind of hold they had over Nana, but it wasn't going to work with me. Nana told me to never come back, and this must have been why. It was midnight before the house was finally empty again. I turned out the lights and bolted the door, then crept up the stairs to Nana's bedroom, slipping across the oak boards as though I might wake her. I grabbed the book and box from the nightstand, then stopped at the door, turning to face the room as the faint smell of lavender wafted past. Nana? I said into the darkness, but there was no answer. Down the hall in my bedroom, I cradled the giant tome in my lap, turning each page with the care a book of its age required. Page after page of recipes for potent herbal remedies, short passages about the properties of plants, and journal entries about Nana's life filled every inch of writing space. The oldest were faded and nearly unreadable, but the last entry was made the night Nana died. I'm sorry, little one. I wanted to spare you from this if I could. I tried to keep you away from them, but I knew sooner or later you'd come back. I'd intended to make a go of it myself, but now it's up to you. I left you something to help, but the contents of the reliquary won't be enough on its own. I caught the fleeting image of a dark figure in my peripheral, but tried to ignore it. As a child, I was no stranger to spotting shadows out of the corner of my eye, or hearing voices whispering at night. But I was never afraid of them. I never worried, because I knew I was safe with Nana. Now she was gone, and I shuddered at having to face them alone. I turned my attention to the ornate wooden box, the reliquary Nana mentioned. Several sigils were burned onto the wooden bottom, while metal runes were inlaid along the edges, meeting at an iron clasp in the middle of the lid. It reminded me of a miniature coffin, or maybe that was just the kind of day I was having. The figure appeared again, lingering longer than before. I squeezed my eyes shut, trying to will it away. Breath hit my skin hot and acrid, 
then fingers combed through my hair. I screamed, flailing my arms in wild circles at the empty space around me. I bolted from the bed. I could feel spectral hands reaching for me as I ran from the room into the hallway. I turned back as I reached the top step. A powerful force pushed me off balance, sending me tumbling to the unforgiving floor at the bottom of the stairs. My head throbbed where it collided with the ground, and my vision blurred. The shadowy figure stood at the top of the stairs, shrouded in a black mist with two glinting silver eyes. I scrambled to my feet and swung around the banister, sprinting through the house and out the back door to where my rusted little station wagon was parked. I jumped in, grabbing the keys from the visor. I nearly spun out on the gravel of the long road leading to the old farmhouse, then sped onto the desolate stretch of County Road, heading away from the house and the Fane. I could handle all the legalities by phone, or I could come back with some of my friends to ward off the local color. For now, it was best to just get away. There was nothing for hours. The sun was already starting to peek out in pinks and yellows from beyond the horizon, but the corn and wheat just kept going. It didn't matter. I was putting distance between me and the Fane. Finally, I saw a turn-off and took a chance, hoping there would be somewhere I could get some gas, or at least use a phone. The wind changed directions, making my wake of gravel dust lurch out in front of me, obscuring my view as I crept along the narrow country road, but I could still make out a structure in the distance. My car stalled out as I pulled up to the familiar shape of my childhood home. I was back. I drove all night and part of the day, and somehow I ended up back at Nana's. I knew you'd be back. Didn't I say she'd be back? Doris Linden reclined in one of the Adirondack chairs, lined up on the wraparound porch. Beside her, a young couple lounged in the mid-morning sun. Did I have a choice? I said, trying to control the anger I felt flooding my face and chest. Oh, hon, of course not. She laughed politely. You're ours now, kiddo. That power of yours sealed the deal. What do you mean? The powder you made me worked like a charm. I sprinkled it all over a picture of my husband, like you said. Then he sprinkled himself all over the living room with a shotgun. God, I laughed so hard I thought I was gonna wet myself. She stood, and the others followed after her, chuckling. He what? I sank to the ground all the fight draining out of me. Oh, don't look so upset. You did good. I've been trying to get rid of him for years. Who are you people? I said, my voice weak and pathetic. The group smiled, silver flashing in their eyes. We are the followers of Mendex, the man said, adjusting his wireframe glasses. The Fane is his temple, and we are his children, the young woman added. He lives through us. Doris opened her arms in a wide gesture, as though it had all been well rehearsed. What the hell is a Mendax? Oh, an old deity. He was here long before we showed up, and I'm sure he'll be here long after we're gone. She looked me up and down, then shook her head in disappointment. You know, your family's always had power. I don't know where it came from, but it's in your blood. Hardly seems fair, does it? Someone centuries ago pissed off a god you've never even heard of, but you're the one who pays the price. She looked sympathetic for a moment. Well, you know what they say. Shit rolls downhill. The trio howled with laughter. I got to my feet and ran to the house. We've had a hold of your family for the last 200 years, sweetie. So don't go thinking you're gonna get away from us, Mrs. Linden said as I ran past. I slammed the door shut behind me, 
and locked the deadbolt, then retrieved Nana's book and box from my bedroom and hurried to the kitchen. I seized the obsidian mortar and pestle from its place above the spice cupboard. Leaves, twigs, and dried flowers churned into powder beneath the force of the pestle. I held my intention in my mind. Repel evil. I sprinkled a line of powder in front of every possible entrance I could think of, then gathered my courage to peek out the front window. They were still out there, staring at the house, but they had moved out further onto the lawn. I went back to the book, opening it up to the marked page I was shown before. The child, bound by birth, must bear the iniquity of the forefather. I scanned further down the page, until I saw the name Mendax, who Nana described as a filthy being of deception. Not a demon exactly, but not too far off the mark. Mendax the Liar, written in my grandmother's curved and flowing style. An old evil, who preyed upon our family when we refused to submit our power to his rule, cursing those born with a gift to serve his followers. I could hear cars pulling up outside, and voices calling out to one another in greeting. These people, Nana's journal continued, the people of the Fane, they are his true children, in body and spirit, the result of an old god philandering with humans. Yeah, awesome, is there a way to stop it? I said, flipping frantically through the pages. Nana, if you can hear me, a loophole would be great to write about now. The scent of lavender breezed past. The jars of herbs I had set out all tipped over at once, flooding the table with small dried flowers and leaves that encircled the wooden box. The relic. I'd nearly forgotten about it. I flipped open the clasp, and the lid sprang open. I gasped, throwing the box back onto the table, then took a few steps back in disgust. Inside, a shriveled human hand was curled into a loose fist. A note fitted into the box's lid unfurled slightly, its corner caressing the gray, leathery skin of the dead hand. I could see yellow bone peeking out from where the once loose skin had been tied off with a bit of twine around the stumps of the severed radius and ulna. I plucked the note from the box, avoiding all contact with a ghoulish keepsake. Beneath the note was a form-fitted indent into the box's velvet lining, where an off-white candle was held. The note gave detailed instructions on the use of the hand and the candle. I took another quick look through the window. The whole town had gathered. The Church of Mendax was assembling on Nana's lawn, and they were headed my way. I went back to the note, reading it aloud. Okay. Place the candle of human tallow, gross, between the fingers of the hanged man's fist, then light the wick to cause all who see it to succumb to paralysis. Normally, I would have laughed at the ridiculousness of it all, but desperation has a weird way of making you willing to try new things. A window broke somewhere toward the back of the house, followed by banging. I reached out, grabbing the pickled thing, and wedged the candle between the middle and ring finger. I plunged my hand in the junk drawer, the most likely place for matches to be. I could hear wood splintering, then several sets of footsteps inside, making their way to the kitchen. Finally, my shaking hand took hold of a matchbox. I looked up to see silver eyes staring back at me from the darkness beyond the gap of the pocket door. Oh shit! Oh shit! I fumbled with the matches, dropping them to the floor. The door slid open with such force, it broke through its frame coming to a stop somewhere inside the wall. I grabbed the matches again, and flicked the first match against the strike strip forcefully. The head lit, but broke off from the wooden stick, tumbling into the pile of herbs on the table, which began to release fragrant smoke. 
the silver-eyed mob breached the kitchen, forcing me back to the far wall. The window beside me burst inward, where more of Mendax's troops slipped inside. Oh, come on! Slow as smooth, smooth as fast, I said to myself, striking a second match. The tip held and combusted. Someone grabbed hold of my shirt from behind, as I lit the candle clutched in the long-dead hand. It spit and sputtered before blazing to life. The crowd froze. I tore myself away from the mob's grip, picking my way between all the bodies packed in the small room, their glinting eyes following as I passed. You will serve those loyal to me, the man with the wireframe glasses said from over my shoulder. Mendax spoke through them, moving from person to person like a virus. I closed my eyes and took a deep breath. Banish evil, I said, holding the intention in my mind. The slowly burning herbs filled the kitchen with their pleasant odor, causing the crowd to shudder violently in response. I sat the morbid candle holder on the counter near the door, then grabbed several brown glass bottles from the cupboard. A heavy black miasma streamed from the eyes of the townsfolk, curling and coiling from their bodies, until a smoky figure reformed at the center of the kitchen. Two silver eyes shone from within the churning mist. The people lowered their gaze, in reverence of their deity that stood before them. You will serve my followers. The voice was calm and ancient. I smiled, then held up one of the brown glass bottles marked alcohol Nana used for tinctures. Yeah? What if you don't have any followers? I smashed the bottles on the ground, then quickly lit a match and tossed it into the puddle spreading across the kitchen floor. Screaming erupted behind me as I fled the house to the front lawn, where I watched the flames consume my childhood home and the paralyzed residents of Liar's Fane. I walked away from the smoldering ruins, with the thick scent of herbs and roasting flesh hanging in the air. The moon was high overhead by the time I reached the junction road leading to the highway, where a young woman in a passing car stopped to offer me a ride. I gladly accepted, sinking into the passenger seat, exhausted, eventually falling into a deep sleep. I woke to the sound of rain pattering the car's roof and windows. The woman in the driver's seat put the car in park and turned off the engine. You sleep okay? She said. Yeah, thanks. I really appreciate the ride. I pulled the lever and brought my reclined seat upright to see out the window. My breath caught in my throat, dislodging as the primal sound of a trapped and terrified animal. Outside the window, in the cool morning rain, the farmhouse stood as it always had, amidst the corn and wheat, unmarred by flame. It's no trouble. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.